Hello, everybody. Welcome to Hash Church episode 149. It is the Bubble Man here. Kind of been MIA for the last couple of episodes. Give thanks to Dr. Natasha for holding church down. She absolutely has been doing an incredible job. And of course, all of you for showing up and watching. Mama holding down the chat. Melty Heads. Jay Hendricks, thank you for smoking pot. Sean8033, we got Bingo Lombardi in the room. Uh, Dabs for Days and Sal Shatino. The regulars, the, the crew, holding it down as they do every week. Uh, I'm going to send out the invitations here real quick to the panelists and see if we can't get ourselves started on a little hash church show here today. Definitely have some beautiful hash to smoke with you all here on Hash Church today. This is some of what I made recently. I'm not sure if it's gonna, oh, there we go. So you can see the quality. Uh, easily can put this upside down and shake it. Nothing's coming out, I can promise you that. Johnny B. Good morning. <clears throat> and, and Etienne, how are you, my friend? I am well, how are you? Doing pretty good, you know. I've got uh, some beautiful head stash. It's Sunday morning, and uh, I feel like it's my first church in a while. Yeah, it's mine too. <laughs> it's been a couple right? weeks. Yeah, so I haven't also not been around. So I didn't. Uh, I didn't even know you hadn't been around. That's how. That's how not around I've been, Etienne. It's all good. I uh, I was able to escape up to uh, Alaska, and actually, I was in Canada this week, and <clears throat> over in Victoria. You were in Canada in Victoria. That's crazy. Yeah, which is just a literally like a four to five hour stop. That's it. Wow. We pulled in at seven and they're like, it's one o'clock. We got to go. <laughs> You're like, well, we've seen Canada. I mean, how, how big could Canada possibly be? I mean, how long do you really need to see Canada? Well, I got to see the miniature museum and the bug museum and, you know, in the museum district there in Victoria. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious, dude. I gotta give it to you guys. You guys are so polite, and it's, it's such a beautiful area. Everybody was out taking care of their topiaries, and there's beautiful topiaries all over the place. I mean, it's 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 wonderful to watch and be part of. I have to admit. Well, I saw that it was uh, you finished off the states. That was it for you, wasn't it? Yep, I did all fifty states. And when I got to Alaska, when I was, since I was on Hash Church, the wonderful people over at Rainforest Gard Rainforest Farms. In Juneau, Alaska, invited me over to their garden. So I literally got into Alaska and went straight to a garden. <laughs> and then I get home and I open up this Cannabis Business Times, which is a magazine here in the States. And there's the grow I was at in Juneau, Alaska. That's so trippy. Yeah. So <clears throat> they're all growing on LEDs up there. Uh, this is Fluence Lights ad. But I want to thank Gianno Barrett and the wonderful people at Rainforest Farms. Uh, they were awesome. Uh, it was fascinating what's going on up in Alaska compared to what's going on stateside because I've been able to go through other states and see what's transpiring. And sure, Alaska is very much like the early part of California. Everybody is bootstrapped. No one can get any kind of money to do whatever they need to do. So everybody has to bootstrap from the bottom on up. So right, everyone seems to be growing with LEDs. Some people are just growing and selling what they grow where others buy from distributors. So it was interesting to see um, how frustrating it is. <clears throat> Check this out. If they need to send in a sample, because they have to have everything tested to show exactly you know, their THC CBD, although CBD is illegal in Alaska, to the dispensaries, but they're selling it in health food stores. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the marijuana there is it's, it's very good. Um, it's not the quality that I expect yet, um, or of California, et cetera, that I'm used to. But um, they're very popular with edibles there because everybody comes in on uh, cruise ships. So, uh, yeah, so edibles are really high. They don't have a lot of, in fact, I didn't really see any distillates. Rainforest uh, Farms is working on that. But for the most part, it's mostly just flowers and edibles, not a lot of other ancillary products. But it costs $700 to fly to the laboratory, get a sample. So it doesn't matter if you have one sample or 50, it costs you $700 to get it there. Forget about the testing price, it's the helicopter cost. 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you'd think it'd be cheaper to send it by dog sled, but unfortunately there's only a handful of testers in the state of Alaska. So, uh, you know, they're reliant on, on that reality currently. So it was beautiful to see everywhere we went, everybody was selling cannabis. So every city we stopped in, Skagway, Juno, and Ketchikan, there were multiple retail dispensaries for 21 and older. So it was fascinating to get an eye on the uh, scene outside of the uh, lower 48. I mean, I'm going to see what happens in uh, uh, Hawaii in December because they finally opened things up. But yeah. Uh, Outside of the lower 48, that's all I've been pretty much aware of. So it was fascinating. Well, cool beans. Did you get your mic unmuted there, John? No, you did not. No. You have to reset your whole uh, computer most likely. That's usually what happens. You can kind of try to reset the browser, but you might have to. <laughs> Johnny B, what a character. In and out. I got to spend the last uh, seven or eight days with Johnny B on a little trip to Jamaica. We had uh, we had a good time. Let's just say Tony was there as well, as well as our uh, uh, Jamaican partners, and it was uh, it was wonderful. It was good. We got to visit a nice field. We got to you know talk about the future of of products in Jamaica. So it's good. I got to actually tour Tony's lab before I left, so I got to see the whole nine yards going on there. There we go. Are we there? Ah, so you got to see Advesa. No? Yes. Well, and Bubble Man brand. Well, that's part of Advesa, absolutely. Advesa and Prana and Blue River Terpenes are all uh, all getting produced uh, there at the Advesa oh, lab. Working. It's working, John. Hello. We hear, you. We hear yes. you. Yes, yes, it's working, Johnny B. Just remember, keep your mic muted when you're not talking. Like I'm not doing right now. <laughs> no. Um, so, um, what was I talking about? I lost my sense of. You were talking about Alaska. You were talking about. Mm, no, you were talking about Tony's lab that you went and visited. Yes, Tony's lab, dude. Mega props. I've never seen anything that is as state of the art as state of the art gets. I had to go in and immediately put booties on top of my shoes, and everything about the place was state of the art, top of the line. Um, I have been waiting to see something like that. So I was beyond proud to see, you know, hospital grade floors and walls and things like that, which is the reality that is needed, you know, to take things to the next level. So I was very impressed by what they've been able to um, bring forward. Yeah, well, I mean, the the way I say it is, Tony's no slouch. It's uh, it's been this has been five plus years in the making since really we met in Amsterdam. And uh, with the you know with the the evolution and the innovation of prana, with the creation of Blue River terpenes, and finally the birth of uh, you know the the Bubble Man brand actually getting launched, it's been uh, it's been very symbiotic with those three brands. That's for sure. It's been exciting, I'll tell you from my perspective, sitting up here in Canada, being a part of it through Skype and video chats, but still not being there. You know, it's incredible. It was interesting to – it's one thing to hear something and, and, you know, to think about, okay, this is a possibility. It's another thing to actually walk into that reality. So it was good to see the future. That right. Happens, you know, because I hear people say it all the time. And, you know, I hear people say, you know, the most common thing I ever hear is, you know, oh, my God, this is the best part you're ever going to see. You know, and, you know, I, I wish I could – Every time you know you've heard that bubble man, you know once you hear that from somebody, what you're going to see is definitely not even close to the best but you're going to ever see. <laughs> <clears throat> it's true. It's it's true. You know, it was. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a, a a difference too in regards to commercial production of resin and producing something on a on this level that is because it's going to be sold to so many different people that, that you know you need to really raise the bar to protect everyone that you're selling to to make sure that you're selling everything that's on par no molds no microbials etc testing for pesticides much like you guys have been doing for so long but then you know there's the other side of the coin where's where I started and recently being in Ontario for this little couple of days of hash making I made some beautiful hash got a little bit uh, just sitting on the top of the jar there uh, really really nice quality um, Five star, I guess I would call it, not quite six, but five star for sure. And I didn't make it in a lab. I made it in a garage with concrete floors and with tools hanging everywhere. And with so 
there's kind of, oh, I wanted to welcome Sub Cool to the room as I'm telling this story. Welcome, Sub. Just hey, telling. Buddy, how you doing? Everyone's got the blue microphone. I fucking love it. You know, I'm just talking about the difference right now, Sub, between Tony's lab, the Advesa lab, which is probably what I would call the most cutting edge hashish laboratory going right now, at least in North America. Uh, but on the flip side of that is the beautiful thing about bubble hash and the ability to make your own bubble hash is that you can do it in your own kitchen. It doesn't require a lab. You can, you can, you can bust out the most beautiful, damn near pharma ratio quality, pharma purity, 99.9%, .9%, if not 100% heads. And I did it recently in an area that, you know, most people would be like, oh my God, you can't, you can't make bu bubble next to that, or you can't do this and that. But it, you know, it's part of the thing that we have to remember about bubble hash is that you don't require a laboratory to make it for yourself, that you can make it in your kitchen with a little spoon and a little bucket and it's, uh, the quality is really on par and I would say that it's, uh, it's kind of one of the bonuses of, of bubble hash. One thing. I well, you know, you we, we've known each other a long time, Mark, and I will tell everybody this. Well, I mean, I'm not some pro hash maker. I've never made tons of amounts. I've never sold hash, but but with your bubble bags, I was able with a steel spoon in my kitchen and some ice to make killer product. I mean, you can see my product all over the net. Yeah. I never made more than a gram or two. Um, for you guys watching me and Bubble Man had this kind of thing. Uh, I used to press my little teeny pieces of hash. And I do now know that I was pressing water in it, by the way, and telling you publicly, I was pressing a little bit of water in it. But the pucks were so small, it wasn't an issue. And and, and, and Bottle Man was pressing a lot more hash. And so he used to spread it out more. And that's kind of how our conversation started. He's like, hey, sub, I see your hash. You should spread it out. Stuff like that. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Well, you, you forgot to mention that with bubble bags of stainless steel in your kitchen, you forgot the most important part, your uber dank weed. <laughs> Yeah, like me. So. I mainly just want I wanted you send me the invitation so much. I wanted to stop by and say, hey, I actually don't I'm not gonna hang out with you guys, but I didn't want to be rude. I'm gonna go get donuts with my lovely wife. Um, but nice. I didn't want to just look at the link and not say, you know, give you guys some Sunday love. Dude, I appreciate it, bro. I appreciate it. You know, we got a quiet Sunday morning. We got a bunch more people coming and we're gonna get into some pretty heavy conversations today. But I'm always thinking about you and figured I'd send you off the link. You're always welcome to uh to share your space here in Hash Church. Good. We love you. Auntie Anne, good to see you, my friend. I'm going to watch from the phone and, and go do some stuff. But again, greetings to everyone. And welcome to Hash Church. And thank you, guys. Yeah, give our love to Jill. Have a great day, brother. Peace, man. Have a great one. Yep, have a great one. And keep doing that voodoo that you do so well. <laughs> kind of you. like uh, when said, you know, when uh, I was making hash, I wasn't doing it properly. And of course, that's when I met you, Mark. And uh, you showed me the sifting and then instantly started sieving and putting my hash through a colander and not making pucks. And Well, both you and Sub <laughs> were in a unique situation. Both you and Sub had great material, but weren't you know, just needed a few little tips. And so the problem is out there is when people are using shitty material and you give them tips and those tips don't really result in them producing a product that is exciting and, and something that they actually want to, you know, show off and, and share with people. So it's the real bonus in all of this is actually having material to use that is worthwhile using. If you're cleaning up swag, it's just, uh, it's just not going to clean up the way you want it to. Best flowers, best material makes the best hash, period, people. You can't polish a turd. Exactly. Pretty much exactly. I think I said that just the other day. I'm not even joking. I literally said to someone, you cannot polish a turd. Now, people are trying to polish turds. They've got their turd polishing kits out, bro. They buy those kits on they're, Walmart. They're selling those turd polisher kits, man. <laughs> and you can add stuff to make your, your turd smell better. You know? <laughs> Oh which, my is, God. which is a problem. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, that's something that we've seen all the way back from when people would put in orange peels, you know, to change the scent mm. a little bit or, you know, thinking they're doing good, you know, but not realizing the damage they're actually doing or creating Sporesville. Like I said, I'll never forget seeing my buddy walking up to my friend's apartment, seeing these buds hanging. And I was like, I was like, what the fuck is all over them? They look so weird. And he's like, oh, I sprayed them with orange crush. I was like, what? <laughs> he sprayed his colas with orange crush. Apparently it dries and is very sticky and looks very good. I just, to... I left, I left the room. I left the house. I left that relationship. I left, I left, I left. 
I know people back in the days, it was the old Coca-Cola trick, you know, sprayed down with Coca-Cola. Uh, the last uh, couple of days before you harvest it, it dry up, it looked like it had crystals on it, it'd be stickier than hell. And it did, let's look at the weed, it sticks to the wall. And uh, hey, that was the late 80s, early 90s that I recall. <laughs> well, they, they still do it that Seriously. way. Back when I was originally buying and selling weed, the Mexican okay. that I got was all compressed with coca-cola uh, so it was brown and if you actually would break open that quarter pound you'd see the sugar stains on the inside i mean it was absolutely dumbfounding but that's just that's how it is that's how they it was the easiest way to grow crystals back then that's not the easiest way to grow crystals <laughs> i know it's not i'm saying that's what I people like, were doing i would like to welcome mr skunkman sam to the room dr natasha to the room and the lovely sarah sunday to the room Welcome all. Welcome everybody, and good morning, yeah. ladies. Yeah, good to have you all here. What's going on in the good world? Well, I know Sarah, I invited Sarah today because we are closing in, we're getting closer and closer. It's gotta be a month, a month and a week or something away from uh, the Karma Cup, which is a local cup that we have here in Canada that Sarah's been putting on, geez, I wanna say for the last four years, am I correct? Yes. This is the fourth year, the fourth annual, as we call Holy it. Holy shit, look at where you are right now. Yeah, this is where I live. <laughs> that is awesome, Sarah. Holy shit. I could, I could only see your avatar. I hadn't opened up your camera, but when you spoke, it went full screen, and I was like, holy smokes, that is awesome. I can just picture yeah. a big, big like, um, stage in the back behind you, and a big, massive concert just pounding. And Karma, I could Karma. do it. I got... <laughs> I have 50 acres here. No, so no, no. I the can... best, listen, the best part about that acres? property, the best part of yeah. that property is that there's nobody on it. That's the best part yes. of that property. Yes. I could, you would be would so stressed out. You would... <laughs> I would never have a party oh here. It would be like the biggest security risk ever. Uh, you, you know, growers, right? You don't ever let anybody come to your place. Like, I, I know you. <laughs> we have having like. And... Dogs. A lot of people knowing where I am, that would be, I would never sleep again. That's what I'm saying. I know you very well. And the idea of you having <laughs> a big stage and a party at your property, I, I could just imagine you'd just be ruined. Yeah, it wouldn't be working for me. I can do as big as I, as I have it now and no bigger. That's like the length of the, my stress level would be too high. That's for sure. Fucking right. Well, thank you for coming in in such a beautiful uh, environment. How about yourself, Natasha? Did you watch the uh, fireworks last night with the crew? Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, had a nice uh, evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a nice evening out in Vancouver last night. Went to check out the fireworks show with uh, Kristen and Tyler. And yeah, it was nice. They have a nice patio from their apartment and kits. So we didn't have to get up in all the crowds or anything. Could watch from afar. My preferred uh, fireworks uh, watching venue. But yeah, it was Team Japan. They put on a good show. It was uh, just a nice night. Nice to go out. I've been kind of hermity writing and staying in my apartment lately. So it was nice to check out the city. And Yeah, but the end of that fireworks display last night, wasn't that amazing? Like I was right on the beach in Kits. And oh, nice. it was just... I mean, the lights, the sky just lit right up. And for Vancouver to be so beautiful, I was staring right at the barge. And wow, it was uh, it was really good to see. They have one August 2nd or August 3rd, I think, too. But uh, I didn't see it down there with all the 100,000 people down there. Yeah, it's totally a different experience when you're up on the beach right under the fireworks, which I've also experienced. And is, I, I did that a few years ago in Vancouver. And lightning and thunderstorms are very rare here. And there happened to be this epic lightning storm going on while the fireworks were going on. So that was very, very cool. But that's awesome. Always a nice show. Also being out on the boat is always one of my favorites. Getting out on the boat and being like almost next to the barge is a really, really beautiful spot to see those fireworks from. Yes, I yeah. haven't had that experience yet, so I'll have to do that for the next uh, fireworks show. Yeah, I could probably maybe drive the boat out to Kits, drop it in the water there, and then we could go out on the boat and watch. That way I don't have to drive my boat three hours from where I live all the way around the mountain to get to, uh, which is scary trying to get home. Take about three plus hours in the pitch black, driving like two kilometers an hour looking for logs and other things in the water. Yeah, I'll come with yeah, you. Yeah, un unnecessary. <laughs> Can be we scary. can make hey, some welcome. along the way. 
Hey, welcome D420K in the room. Good fuck, it seems like I haven't seen you forever, buddy. I know, man, I know. You, you've been traveling. We've been, we had the, the last, the last show I was on was before the, the ladies took over the show. Me too. I got to say, <laughs> that was an incredible show too, Natasha. Way to go. Like, yeah. kudos to you. Yeah, mega kudos. Good job. And, you know, of course, let's do a bong rip, you mother lovers. Oh, there we go. Let's do a bong rip, and then we'll have uh, Sarah give us the lowdown on what's going on with the Karma Cup this year. Um, I have a great time at the Karma Cup. Lots of people ask me, you know, oh, there's so many different events. Uh, you know, what uh, – for me, I'll give you my perspective, not as a person who's going to the event to see the booths, to, to see the bands, to see the talks, because I don't go for any of that. I'm a businessman. I go to expose my company to people. And I can say this, that out of all the shows I do, I do really well at the Karma Cup, not just for business, but for interactions with people who have come from all over Ontario, Canada, and the U.S. to actually come see me or to see John or to see whoever else is at this event. And so I really feel that the Karma Cup is a success for that reason. Um, a lot of the larger, bigger sort of conferences that are, I guess, a little bit more, you know, less smoking and more conference, I don't really do very well at those conferences. I don't really do uh, much business, but uh, at the Karma Cup, it's business like crazy. So from a business perspective, which is I think my most accurate perspective that I can give you, uh, it's a great event. It's worth having a booth and it's worth going down there and getting some exposure. So what do you say, Sarah? You want to tell us a little bit about this year's cup? Yes, totally, Mark. Um, so it's uh, first off, it's September 9th and 10th in Toronto. Um, two days on um, over the weekend. It's the weekend after Labor Day. Oh yeah, my joint was just delivered to me. I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> I was waiting for that. I had to send a text. I'm like, did you get me my joint? Anyway, he's very nice to roll it for me. Thank you, Josh. Josh is the man. Uh, yes, he is. He's awesome. Um, okay, so um, September 9th and 10th in Toronto. It's um, an expo, we've got speakers, it's a competition. Like for instance, right now, uh, just the other day, we um, had the in-person entry date and got all the entries in. It looks like there's gonna be over a hundred again this year. Um, I could still use more bud and concentrates though. So um, if you have bud or concentrates and you wanna enter, um, hit me up and I'll give you another week. So that's like 200 grams approximately of bud and 32 grams of concentrate. We'll deal with the details. If you want to hit me up, Sarah at the karma cup.com or like on any of the socials, basically um, I'll read your DM and uh, we can figure it out. I've got the most ridiculous quantity of edibles this year. Um, people are just going crazy. Uh, it, it's pretty cool to see the mature marketplace that we've developed and how many new companies are out there and how many people are excited about the industry and trying to um, innovate and uh, bring good products to the public. So I'm super excited. I really hope that in our new legalization framework that we, that all these new companies really get a chance to, to show what they're, to demonstrate their knowledge that they've acquired over years of experience in the industry. Um, it would really be a shame if all this industry knowledge is um, not taken advantage of. So yeah, um, I'm almost sold out of booths. I've got um, like zero small booths and I've got like maybe under five big booths left. So if you want a booth, like I would get on it Monday or Tuesday because I would expect them to be done by Thursday. Um, yeah, I've got a ton of sponsors right now. I've got, um, Diamond, Fido, um, High North, uh, damn it. I had a list. I was more prepared for my last interview because I had a bit more time. Um, let me see who else I got here. Sponsor and vendor info. This is the, this is the beauty of Google Sheets. Oh, I use them all the time. The Google yeah. Docs and Sheets, yeah. It's Google so Calendar, useful. my friend, now. Okay, here we go. I know what's happening now. Loading. Loading. Don't embarrass <laughs> me. Load faster. Hey, we can okay. do a bong rip while it's loading. Yes, do a do bong you? rip, please. Let's do a bong rip. Hey, Johnny, when are you getting a haircut, scruff dog? 
<laughs> Yo, it's the it's the new Ed Sheeran look. I went to his concert last night. I signed some signatures. Apparently, I'm an Ed Sheeran lookalike. People thought it might be my dad. <laughs> so you know what? You know what? I was in. I was even in uh, Edmonton, and uh, and we were sitting at a bar. I was with uh, Drew from Boveda, and I was with Helena. And somebody came up and bought us some drinks. And goes, hey, want to buy a drink yet? So, you know, <laughs> oh, that's a fun in life, life, right? Keep going, Johnny. Keep growing it, then. It's doing good for you. I'm just letting it go. You know. Well. We got, it, we got it, it worked out really good for you at customs when you came back from Toronto that hair, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. I got <laughs> to customs and uh, actually got pulled in and they went through all my stuff. The guy said I was looked interesting and he wanted to talk to somebody. But uh, said and done, it was an experience and uh, got out of there nicely and then hung out with Mark. Went and saw him and Yes, missed his flight, actually. I was I was gonna another say another flight. Time. Comb your hair over next time. I swear to God, the customs guys, they pick anything they can to cause us problems. This kid uh, was like 20 years old, and he said he was doing his job. And he, he, he finds people he likes to talk to. That's what he told me. Oh, you look like someone interesting to talk to. So I educated him all on cannabis. It's pain control. <laughs> well, tell them, what, tell, tell them what you said when you got to customs, and he said, what were you doing in Jamaica? I, I was educating doctors on how to subscribe cannabis to patients. And I was tra them. training doctors, he says, with his hair standing out like this. <laughs> the guy's like, I'll talk to you over there, please. <laughs> yeah, so that's what went on. It was fun. Oh, and, uh, we got to have a session, and I ordered you some pizza. Had some pizza, you know, went to spend the night. It, it, it was three days to get to Jamaica in February. This time it took me three days to get home. So that's true. Pretty good. That's true, because mm -hmm. John, John couldn't leave from Jamaica. From, from Jamaica, we dropped him off at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At 10.30 at night, he texts me and says, I am still here. My flight never left. Everyone's rioting. The army and the police are here. People are throwing up and having heart attacks. There's the, uh, the ambulance is here. So we went and saved him. We went and picked him up and got him, and he stayed with us. And then we were like, all right, let's go back to – we'll go to Toronto together. But I was staying in Toronto to make some hash. John was going to continue on to uh, Vancouver. And they made him miss his flight. Like, fuck, I was stoked, though, dude. We got to puff a nice little session that night. It was kind of nice, you know? And then and then because of the screw-up and the whole thing, and, and yes, it was a Jerry Springer at the airport in Kingston, Ooh. Jamaica. There was people arrested. People were puking. Um, I put on my Facebook, people were rioting. It was it was pretty intense. And then awesome. they shoved everybody on the plane the next day. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going over this thing. So... Um, needs to say, we all made it home nicely. Yeah, things went fantastic. Jamaica was amazing. Um, lots to talk about. I think we need Tony to be on here to talk more about what's going on in Jamaica and for the world because it's some pretty good stuff going on, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'll be on a little later on today. He's been uh, touring Slant. around. He's been touring around some people and uh, pretty busy the last couple of days. I know. Yesterday, I watched him on Google Chat filling up the first Bubble Man pen with, uh, I think it was strawberry banana goo, as well as the 30% terpenes in there. And uh, I guess we'll hear a little bit about that. He was going to Andrew uh, D'Angelo's birthday party last night to hit everyone up with the, uh, with the new pen. I'll tell you one thing, when he hit that pen on the camera, he literally blew right out of the scene. He was sideways, he hit it like this, and then he coughed and blew backwards out of the camera view. It was quite funny. I guess the pen has been designed to really rip like a nail. We don't want these little puffy, light, you know. But also designed to give a standardized dose, and that was the biggest thing that we were talking about. I liked how Tony was talking about how to get a dose every time. Yeah, well, the standardized dose is actually the 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 other unit that he was talking about with the Teflon mesh, not our pen uh, at all. That, well, I know it's a but that's that was it. That was a different unit, but also very cool nebulizer. That's <coughs> that's, that's <coughs> the future. Well, What's up? Long rip. You ready, Sarah? Do it again. Come on. Yes. Yes, All I'm right. ready. I unmute Back to Sarah's cup. Okay. So I'll give it to you as fast as possible. I know plugging is terribly banal, uh, but got to do it. These people are helping me out. They've enabled us to um, basically make the event happen. So I thank everybody very much. This is basically an order of alpha because that's how I have them listed. Uh, so it's 420 Florist, a new dispensary in Toronto, is one of our community sponsors. 91 Supreme, they make concentrates. They're a diamond-level sponsor. BC Bud Depot is gold. <laughs> We're going to get some more seeds and swag and fun stuff in the bag. 
Bogart is going to be a diamond level sponsor. They make extraction gear. Clearly Delicious is a community sponsor. Cloud9 Platinum. Awesome. We love Brittany. She's really making things happen in Hamilton. Uh, Diamond Extracts is going to be a platinum or sorry, a diamond level sponsor. Glacial Gold is going to be a gold level. Green Grow is a gold. Honey Badger is gold. Jordan of the Islands is platinum. More seeds. Yay. Medman Brand, Weed Seed Feed. He's a platinum. Uh, Miss Envy is a gold. Uh, now Magazine, again, is going to be a community sponsor and give me some good advertising rates. Yay. Uh, Phyto Extractions, platinum. Uh, Planet Paradise, one of our local lounges. Good friends of mine, really good people. They're a gold sponsor. Pot TV is doing media again. Uh, Pothead Books, Dana Larson is a community sponsor. Um, we totally support everything Dana does. So thank you, Dana, for all your hard work. Uh, Remo Nutrients, a gold sponsor. I love, love, love Remo and Sandy, and I hope they're well. Seaway Valley is a gold sponsor. Skunk Magazine, media sponsor. Um, Smoker's Guide is a media sponsor. Sofa King Bakery, they make lots of delicious edibles here in Toronto. New company, gold level sponsor. Temple Medicinal, a lovely dispensary up in the Sioux, um, is a community sponsor. Um, Terra Pol Cannabis is a platinum level sponsor. The Highway is a media sponsor. Thompson Caribou, cannot forget Thompson. They help me out in so many ways every year. I love you guys. Thank you. Squad and uh, Vapor Central uh, Platinum. So that's like where we're at right now. Lots of sponsors. They're helping me out, giving me uh, money and things to make the event happen. So everybody, if you can go out and support those guys, I would truly appreciate it. I gotta and give of course, you're... Oh, go ahead. You're coming too. You're coming too, right, Mark? I will be there 100% supporting in any way that I can. I just wanted to shout out Jordan of the Islands as well. He sent me a big, huge seed uh, collection here recently, his entire catalog, I think. So give thanks, Jordan. I'll uh, get those cracked and uh, I'll give them to everyone I know because that's what I do. I give away genetics. And if any of you I have a problem seeds. with it, may, <laughs> the, may the suck a bag of dicks. Yes. Well, thank you for the watermelon by way of John last year, two years ago, whenever it was. You know it. The watermelon does well. Yes, she's it's beautiful. Sift. It's sift. She's yeah, beautiful the way point. she grows. The calyx is stacked on top yeah. of calyxes, you know? Very bumpy looking. Oh, and yeah. It gets red, too, if you let it go and it's cold. Oh, my God, it gets this crazy red ruby color. Really beautiful plant. And stinky and yeah it's a fan favorite basically you know sh fan sh favorite. Sh shout out to sub cool because that uh, was done under his banner that is a tga genetics that is the astro boy and uh, astro boy was done as an accident i guess bad boy was taking care of the grow for sub while he was potentially i think he might have been in jail at the time and bad boy didn't realize this male and i can't remember if it was an apollo 13 or an ortega or something but it ended up i think it was apollo yeah so ortega. that ortega yeah, one of the two. Those two we used to have a lot back then, especially in Winnipeg where I'm from, and this is where the grow was, and this is, happened to be where Sub was doing some time. So it was, uh, yeah, it was just all kind of unique. And I'll never forget my friend in my living room giving that cut to my mentor, Ron Hickey, and Ron kind of being like, oh, this wasn't the one I wanted. You know, you promised me another one, and now you're not giving it to me. He was really kind of a little bit upset. And, I, I, in, 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 you know, I, I respect what he was upset about, but it was less than – three months later that uh, that tune changed and he's just been praising the Astro Boy ever since. Oh yeah. yeah. It's a good plant. I enjoy it heavily. So thank you guys for sharing genetics. And you know, it's very important to share genetics because I recently had an incident where I came back from a trip and uh, a couple of my mothers had like died because somebody hadn't actually gotten them water. And I was like all super bummed out. And one, it was one of my favorite plants and I, I'd given it away, so I'm able to get it back. Woo! Isn't that the way to do it, right? Yeah. When you share the genetics, I saw someone post recently this beautiful spear. It was probably like a two and a half foot long, just spear of beautiful purple bud, uh, greenish purple bud covered in resin, like white. And the guy was all happy because he had given it away a bunch of times. And he, had, he was able to get it back because he was giving it away. It's a pretty simple thing, people. If you don't understand it, if you hoard something and then you kill it, uh, it will be gone and you will be the person to blame. 
Sorry to tell you. It's hard words Marcus, to hear. You yes. You mentioned that you were giving away free seeds. Uh, did you know I patented that? So if you give away free seeds, you actually have to pay me. Well, listen to this, Sam. Not, not only did I know that, the free seeds I'm giving away are yours. Oh, fucking <laughs> shit. I know you've That's got awesome. it patented. I know you've got it patented. Oh my God! Sharing is caring. That's what you always said, Mark. Sharing is caring. That's yeah, why we I mean, share information or knowledge and what we do here every weekend. We share. That's it, and it's it for for the level that we're at. I'm not tell, talking about Skunk Man Sam. Go take his 40 years of work of his registered cultivar uh, and go, you know, peel it off and and share it with the entire world. I understand both sides. When there's a business, when you've invested millions of dollars and you've paid PhDs to do work for you, and you have laboratories and greenhouses and all of these things well okay now we're entering a different world and yes of course that person those people who have done that work should be paid for their work they should get something uh out of that so i, I see both sides i'm just talking about cultivars that are all on the all on this level of of being able to if you can buy it well i can share it if I can get it, I can share it. I have it. no problem with giving away free seeds. I strongly believe in it. Oh, I'm sure you've probably given away more seeds than than anyone I know. I can only imagine the kilos and kilos and kilos of seeds that have uh, left your hands to go to other people. You've even taken it upon yourself to collect other seeds. I'll never forget being at Sam's house and he started pulling these giant fucking seeds out, literally like this big. Remember he had one on his uh, couch one time and people thought it was one of those pillows you sit on when oh, you have- It was a Coco de Mera seed, the nut in the world. Coco de Mera. So it's an unbelievable thing to get that put in your hand. Like here, check this out. And I'm like, what, you shipped one of these back from the Seychelles or wherever you were? And he's like, no, I shipped a, a trunk load of them back. <laughs> Oh, fuck. I just appreciate Sam. I really do. <laughs> we think bag loads are just a stash loads. He thinks trunk loads, and that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, a trunk load of these seeds was probably 12. I don't know. I, I, they're huge fucking seeds. If they fall on you, they can kill you. Oh, I bet. How, how much does – what does it weigh? Like a kilo or something? No, no. It's more like 40 kilos. Holy, like when it's full of water and fresh? When it's full of water and it still has a husk on it. Because what you saw was de husk, just like a coconut is de husk. Oh, Jesus. That's just incredible. Incredible. So I guess, uh, Natasha, are we going to have uh, Adrian come in today? Are we going to talk about... Uh... Yeah, he should be coming on. He texted me, said he'd be about 15 minutes Away. Cool. So he said he'll be on, and yeah, we'll talk about his new study. Excellent. I know Kevin was in a situation that he wasn't sure if he'd be able to. Uh, he's uh, what did he say? He's on he's on Block Island, and the bandwidth might be crummy. So, but he said Adrian and Siren would make uh, great guests. Yeah, Adrian Siren. will do an awesome job, and uh, Chimera may join. I don't know. I've been texting yeah, I him, sent so. I, I sent Chimera the link as well. So hopefully we'll get into that. That's kind of cutting edge. That's the new, new, new. Yeah. So we'll we'll wait to talk about it till he pops on, but uh, that'll be soon. And did you get to see Ed and Jane last night? No, I never did end up connecting with them. Um, I think they're here till the Wednesday show also. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm sure we'll get them uh, get together for a little puff. I was going to mention yeah, something so new, new, new that's happening up here in Canada that was going to be announced or just was announced. High Times is going to be having a Cannabis Cup in Canada August 25th to 27th. So it has taken over the Legends Valley Music Festival and Bio Cup, and it will be officially announced uh, yesterday. It was announced, but it will be released on Monday. But uh, High Times is doing a Cannabis Cup here in Canada. I'll be what? happening in three weeks. Yeah. Well, three weeks. Yeah, it's happening August 25th to 27th. It will be at the Legends Valley Music Festival at the ranch. And uh, I think they're announcing uh, that uh, Tragically Hip is going to be playing. 
Did you see that uh, High Times is also preparing to go public on the stock market? I never no, saw I did that. not know that. That's pretty yeah, cool. that's that's, that's coming news. down the pike. Uh, uh, if people don't know, High Times was recently sold to a, a new group uh, with with a whole bunch of different people, and uh, a lot of people that I know that are good people. So uh, hopefully they'll change uh, some of the direction of the magazine. The cups of of really going in their own direction. Um, but uh, yeah, apparently uh, they're putting together to make a public offering, and it'll be available on the stock market. I don't know what the actual uh, calling letters are, but I thought that was an interesting move, considering the you know legality and how things are becoming more normalized. I don't know if you guys saw, but Sunset Magazine, which is a very normal magazine for your predominant home person or garden person, came out with an article on how to grow marijuana. I mean, how to grow your cannabis outdoor because it's now legal on the entire you know west coast now people can grow their own in certain states so the normal magazines are starting to go okay well now we can talk about this because this is now part of you know adult life over 21 that you know you need to know how to grow yes yeah, sunset it really blew my mind because i've been to their actual uh they have uh, festivals over here in uh san jose and I mean, it's very pomp, very you know, it's it's all the the regular uh, people who sell all the things for your home sponsor it. I'm talking everything from solar panels to the nails to the screws to the hammers, electronic hammers, all that sort of stuff. So it's fascinating to see the normalcy spreading into the media in a way that we have never had exposure where at high times is the only way you could get grow information back in the day hell mark emery even had to do it you know constitutionally up there in canada to sell high times because you know your government wouldn't even allow high times for a time being you know so i think it's kudos that they're now going to have a a cannabis cup finally in canada i think it's fitting and it shows to uh uh, the steadfastness of the Canadian, you know, not give up and you want from not even having the magazine to getting ready to have a cannabis cup. So outstanding. Well, it'll be interesting to see how much sort of traction they can build in three weeks. I did not go to the bio cup last year. I had my friends go and say it was, uh, was fine. It's uh, I have to pick and choose, you know, really carefully with my products because not all the, co the events I go to, uh, end up being worthwhile for me business-wise. Now, when it comes to high times, they've always been able to bring people, but that's with usually like three to six months of advance of being able to like promote and get the event going. So I won't be going to the High Times Cannabis Cup this year, but I know my friends will, and I'm sure we'll get an update on whether or not they pulled it off with bringing the, the, the people that need to come. When you actually have a High Times event, that to me tells me that, Thousands of people are going to come. Four, four to five thousand minimum, maybe ten thousand. There'll be more with the events that will be. Well, we got some headliners we enlisted on Monday, and the new headline is coming up. And uh, High Times has taken over the event because the event was uh, a ten-year event, so they've taken over in the next eight years. So it'll definitely be um, uh, a big event. It'll happen every year for the next eight years at the Grizzly Island Farm um, Ranch, I should say, and. Uh, and uh, on the island, it's going to be fantastic. I hope everybody can make it out this year, but uh, it's uh, all taken over. It's on the website. So if you're interested in tickets, just go to CannabisCup.com. Click on the link Canada. They have Detroit and Spain out there. And uh, there you guys go. Uh, hope to see you all come up for the first uh, High Times Cannabis Cup here in Canada. It's going to be, uh, you know, first from I heard, it might be the second one. They sponsored one years ago, apparently. But um in my opinion, this is the first one that they're doing, and uh, it's pretty cool to see it happen up here, guys. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. It looks like Dabs has crashed. Oh, no, he's awake. No, no. He's looking. Yeah, I was about to say, it looks like Dab was out, but boy, I, Dabs uh, has grown, huh? I Dabs? had her out, uh, out fishing on my pontoon boat with me and seeing if she could handle it. And she is a trooper, man. She loves fishing. I caught a fish last night, and she was just like, she was like, what the hell is that coming out of the water? <laughs> it was cool. She's, uh, she's quite the little adventure doggy. She's not scared of much, that's for sure. <clears throat> well, that's awesome. Nice and nice and chill here on Hash Church. I'm just going to puff more bowls until more conversation comes to me. So, new, new book found. 
Oh, the scratch and sniff weed book. Oh, have scratch you, and sniff. Weed. Have you seen? Have you guys seen this? No. Oh wow, so, so cool. People to send it across the border. I actually got it in Alaska. Uh, one of the, I got it this actually at Gianna's shop there at Rainforest Farms, and uh, it's really cool. It's got cute little illustrations, and uh, they've got little scent stickers, so you can actually scratch and uh, sniff them. And uh, yeah, things smell like uh, a lot of things. The cannabis still doesn't smell a lot, but you know, it's got like a little mango, so you can smell the mango and then lemon and pinene, and it explains some of the you know caryophylline, lemonine, linalool, myrcene. So it, it breaks down terpenes for people. So it's the first uh, that I've seen of a breakdown that's very simplistic uh, for people. And then it goes. <clears throat> I don't know. I literally I got it at the uh, at the shop there. It's uh, it's Abrams Image, uh, AbramsImage.com. And it's uh, the Scratch and Sniff Book of Weed by Seth Matlins and Eve Epstein, illustrated by Anne Picard. Does it smell like Terps? Yes. Yeah, they have some. Yeah, you can definitely tell. Like here's ma here's maple syrup, and it's okay. Oh, maple syrup. But is there cannabis Terps in there? It says so, but they don't smell right. Because because Tony has that technology to make Scratch and Sniff cards and stickers with terpenes. I smelt the Tangy business card. It was unbelievable. I see in the future a Dana Larson scratch and sniff cartoon book, all with weed cultivars. I'm going to put that together. Thank you for showing that book, Etienne. It's needed. I mean, uh, if, if there <clears throat> if there is one thing that's needed, is it's an identifier for these genetics. It's bad enough we've got some of these funny ass names for these things, but it's one thing to know the name. It's another thing to actually have the phenotype set in a sense so that we could actually drop and smell and so that people could acclimate and I could then educate my bud tenders. I can educate then better the patients and the public because then they know what they have, what they're looking for, what they mm -hmm. you know have access to. We've had to learn that from you know our oral, own organoleptic testing or for me i've been i've seen you know i've seen tons and tons of cannabis over the decades so i've been fortunate to understand and get my own knowledge and understanding like each and every one of us on here have for certain genetics but with the new market coming on there needs to be better education tools that we can take forward to the public so that they can absorb, so that they can kind of catch up. I mean, we are at the tip of the spear, all of us here, okay? So, we're. I mean, some of us have been the tip of the spears for, you know, four plus decades, Sam, you know? So, uh, but it's what we need to do. It's another step as Sam <laughs> says to educate the masses is we have to reach out beyond us. We have to reach on the knowledge you know stop preaching to the converted get out there and introduce yourself to somebody and challenge yourself to your own communication abilities and communicate and do your best to stand steadfast to the challenge I would only add that I think to Sam might be the wind in front of the spear as you that's a fact <laughs> he's just what, off the spear. I, what I'm concerned about a little bit is the way some of the extract companies will extract THC and terpenes and then recombine them at the end. But what they're recombining is only five or 10 terpenes. It's not the entire suite of terpenes. When you analyze an average plant, you can find 50, 60 terpenes pretty easy if you look, but most mm. people don't look. Interesting. Sure seems well, like a great form of education, though, for the people that don't have the education on just the terpene profiles. You know, like that, that was pretty interesting. I'm pretty interested in learning about that. Well, I mean, doctors need this education. I mean, not, not only do they need to know about this cannabis, they need to know the different ranges and understand even about terpenes, you know, because some doctors do, but they're mostly the holistic or those that are in the naturopath world. They're not yeah. necessarily those of the regular doctor world. No offense, Dr. Natasha or any other doctors out there. It's just, it's not taught as we, as you know, doctor, it's not taught in, in, in school. You've had to become your own researcher and you know find you know become your own arrow tip and actually go down that path you know mm -hmm. and we've all had to become mm, uh, not only leaders but um, uh, trailblazers because you know the, a lot of us have seen trails but that trail doesn't go the direction that we want so we have to go this other direction we see that trail and we respect that trail for where and where it is done but however it's it's not our trail 
And so we have to find our own path. And so as we're pushing forward and as we're educating ourselves, we have to realize that as we're educated, <clears throat> we have to educate, you know, thousands, you know, I don't want to say it's a hierarchy, but if you look at it like a hierarchy, then a thousand below us is kind of like that pyramid scheme. We have to educate all these people now that we come into contact or interaction with. So any type of education tool that we can simplify the process. So by being sent, you know, all our factory regions is so exponentially we're tied to. I remember I learned that firsthand after I lost my sense of smell for 10 years after the war until it came back on a dog's fart. But still, you know, boom, terpenes kicked back in my nose and, you know, fart it, terps. Yeah, fart terps, be as ugly as it was, you know, if boom. You would have tried beaver uh, terps I had, probably <laughs> five years earlier. <laughs> You're probably Should've. right. So something we could put together for people who have lost their sense of smells. Yes, be be beaver terps scent, scent rescuers. I love it. Well, talking about preaching to the choir, on this last trip to Jamaica, I was lucky enough to speak to a room full of doctors at an event that was put on to educate uh, doctors in Jamaica in regards to prescribing of different medicines. We had some products registered recently with the Minister of Health Department, and so we needed to educate doctors in regards to, you know, first, I guess it was really mainly Tony who obviously came up with Prana and he was explaining the United Cannabis Company, but I got to be on stage and talk about sort of trichome, glandular trichome, where the resin is produced. Good timing, Tony. Literally just started talking about uh, standing up on stage in Mo, uh, in Mo Bay uh, in regards to educating doctors and just was able to kind of give them a little bit of a, a short overview of what the glandular trichome is, how the medicine synthesized inside the head, how we extract and isolate it, and then uh, Tony uh, translated that into uh, the medicine, into prana, so from the resin uh, lesson. Tony went up and then spoke about prana and uh, it was pretty awesome to see because before uh, we spoke it was a lot of people speaking about drug addiction and sort of like a lower level of knowledge of cannabis. Uh, although I will say that Dr. Lorenzo Gordon absolutely blew me away with his uh, 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 what he did with his slides and whatnot, the information that he shared. Uh, would you not agree, Tony, that that was some of the deepest science that you'd ever heard about cannabis and the THC and all the different molecules? Agreed, agreed. He went deep and uh, explained how the brain synapses and uh, receptor work responded uh, to different cannabinoids and ratios and things. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. Welcome to the room, by the way. Thank you. Morning, Tony. Morning, Good everyone. Day. We got, uh, all right. Eyes are a little bit shut this morning. I went to a birthday party last night. And how was that? It's really good. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, extract smoke there, that's for sure. <laughs> I can only imagine. I'm going to smoke some extracts right now, actually. A little bit of this five-star bubble hash that I made uh, just a few days ago in uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. Peace out, everybody. Going for Bracky with the fam. Peace, Dad. Have a good one, D. Have a good day, mother lovers. Enjoy. Be safe out there. Actually, I'm going to bong rip with you on the way out. So. Might, might as well. Well, might as well join you on that. I'm also joining you. Too. So, to, uh, Tony, uh, it's good to see you, sir. Uh, I've told uh, Bubble Man earlier about the trip to your beautiful and wonderful state of the art laboratory. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I hadn't got to connect with you since then. Yeah, you, you went to Jamaica and I went to Alaska. <laughs> How was Alaska? <clears throat> Amaze balls. I mean, there's cannabis everywhere, but it's like it's about it's like 1996. Everybody's still tr clawing. You know, no one can get any type of investors, or you know, so everybody's bootstrapping. No, but no bank will give anybody a loan. And as I said earlier, it costs seven hundred dollars to s fly any sample to the lab to get it tested. So. They have to let it stack up a bit. Yeah. And all that affects price, you know, unfortunately. Uh, but it's, re it's still reasonable. Edibles are the most popular thing there. They need bubble man tech there, man. They do not have full melt. They do not have any of that, unfortunately. Concentrates are lacking. Uh, and they're working on it. But it's very difficult with the, you know, the system there that they have in place, as well as then you insert Alaska weather and 
you know, you can see how the comedy can ensue. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Ooh, this kosher kush is absolute fire. <coughs> so nice to have a variety of, uh, you know, fresh headies, if you will. They're the best ones, in my opinion, the fresh ones. The fresh headies. Actually, this material was 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 cured and dried properly. I kind of asked him that he did that. He was like, should I leave it fresh frozen? I was like, why don't you dry it? And I'll give, I think when you're learning about bubble hash, it's very important to learn first with dry material. Use dry material. Dry material also, there's no cheating involved, i.e. wax membranes filled with moisture that appear to be melty on the first few days of fresh bubble hash being made can often dry out evaporate and leave a buttered out non-melty finished product and that's uh that's sort of where you know fresh frozen people love the fresh frozen because a it's going to preserve those very caustic terpenes that we would otherwise um, evaporate out i had a good conversation with uh, my friend Zach in Ontario, who's just 25 years old, about 20 years younger than me. And he just says, yeah, the young people, they, they want all those as live, as fresh. And I'm like, yeah, those are kind of like terpenes that for what we did for years was we allowed those to evaporate out because they were so rough and caustic and harsh on our throats that now you have this product that everyone's smoking that's just this, it just grabs you so harsh. It's quite different from you know, 20 years ago, smoking something that was absolutely perfectly cured before the hash was even made. So the hash, when you make it, is perfectly cured. Wouldn't you say that there's a big difference in those two things, Sam? A ab absolutely. For me, it, yes, for both the reasons you mentioned, both for taste and smell and, and uh, combustibility and also uh, the moisture. I really don't want any moisture trapped. You got to get it out one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand the reason why people like elevated terpene levels from live resin, but uh, it, it, they need a way to, to, to get it bone dry. I've seen it that way. People, uh, I guess, use uh, uh, evaporator ovens or, or, or even really low temperature freeze dryers or some sort of something because uh, the stuff feels just like a dry powder when I touch it. Right. Yeah, that sounds like a freeze dryer, some type of evaporated unit. Then it's pretty amazing when it, whether it's fresh or uh, or dry sifted. Uh, yeah, it, it's so clean. It's so it's, it's freaking amazing. You just got to get the variety you like the best and bingo. There's definitely something to be said for how it ignites when you actually go to dab it or hit it when it doesn't have that tiny little bit of moisture. It just seems to be like, poof. That's how I like it. Well, THC and most of the terpenes are pretty darn uh, flammable, basically. But they're extremely volatile. And if you catch the volatile part of it on fire, then it sort of... That's uh, we we've seen it in Afghan hubbly bubbles with a flame two or three feet tall. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have <laughs> indoors. That's actually ridiculous. When you're standing next to the hubbly bubbly and you're getting a tan on the side of your face because a flame is shooting up out of the top of the thing, that's that. That's only when you put your resin in, Sam. Well, it's obviously w wasting some cannabinoids and terpenes, but it's also the way to get the, the biggest uh, air intake of uh, vaporized cannabis products that, that's possible. I mean, uh, it, nothing else is quite, is quite like an Afghan uh, hubbly bubbly water pipe. There's nothing like it at all that I've ever come across personally. It's by far, it's the top, top, top for most absolute ripped you can get from from a bong like there's there's what what could possibly okay maybe my glass ham gallon of water gravity bong is a close second but by close i mean like a kilometer and a half it's how the yeah. bubbly is the real deal it, 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 and it, it, you, most people are saying oh but that pipes it, 
it's it's gonna get me too stoned or it'll, <laughs> it's too much smoke or yeah that's why it's designed that way you 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 have to hit, hit on it hit on it and then take a big hit and uh the purpose is to uh get you you know too high <laughs> it's therapeutic for certain and i can only imagine the amount of people in the history of time that hit that pipe and then had to go lay down on pillows or maybe right there on the ground it's designed to get you high. Nothing wrong with that. You know, as we come out of prohibition, as we, you know, as the, as the straightest of the straights, the most conservative Christian, right? You know, just like the straightiest of the straights, as they come to be unbrainwashed with their children and their loved ones using cannabis as a medicine, I suspect that, you know, it's still going to take a while, but at one point in time, we'll really be able to be proud and, and not ashamed to use cannabis for elevation, to, to call it getting high, to say, I'm getting high and it's a good thing. Don't worry about it. It, it shouldn't be associated with like, I just ate two, you know, a bunch of pharma drugs and I'm high and I'm going to, it's not, it's, it's, that's all propaganda. What we mean by high is an elevated state of mind just a, a really elevated state of mind one that is soothing to the five cents prison you know this that we are currently all locked in because if you consider that there's only a small um, amount of space on the graph of what it can be seen or what can be heard you know that we can't hear everything that can be heard we, there's we're in a very small piece of the pie and that's in regards to all our senses so it's nice to have a plant like cannabis to be able to elevate, relax ourselves, and sort of soothe the, soothe these senses. Nitrous, huh? No offense taken, Drew Robertson. Chat's ripping along as always. Got a whole bunch of sh people in there that have been in probably since this morning when I started the link. I do apologize for starting the link so late today. I usually start it uh, a day or two uh, early, and I didn't. I didn't start it till this morning at seven a.m. So, sorry for those people that were probably looking and thinking, "Uh oh, maybe there's no hash church today." Wouldn't that freak people out after 149 weeks? Do you guys realize we're like a couple of months away from three years of doing this show every Sunday? I, I think we should about. either have an invisible or a silent hash church. There you go. <laughs> That'll be the, the third year anniversary. We'll just, no one will show up. I'll open it, but they're just, I'll put, well, I'll, you know what? For the third year anniversary, I insist that we all use dolls as our avatar. Nice job. <laughs> so start looking now for the doll that you're going to use. The little, the little doll. Everyone gets to pick one. I got mine already. <clears throat> you got yours already, Etienne. But then Sam has to show his face for that episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sam's not allowed to use a no, doll. It's just... I will use a doll with my <laughs> face on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's make a 3D. You know what? That's actually crazy. You can get these crazy 3D sculptures of your face and your body. If you, Oh, man, that would be funny for someone to show up with one of those. That'll be Tony. Who else, right? Well, I just printed... Uh, just printed my face. Uh, probably at the end of the show, he'll be like, probably you guys didn't realize this, but uh, my new 3D hash making machine is uses hash as, a, as, a, as, a pro, as, as the main substance, and uh, we're going to dab my head now. And he'll just pick, pick his head right up off the thing, drop it into the nail. you got to do that, Tony. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a simple resin block that goes into <laughs> uh, a poly, polyamorous uh, printer. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I'm trying to get this uh, Bubble Man thing charged that I used last night at the party. It was pretty good. I laughed my head off at how funny you looked when you take the first when you took your first dab on that wheeled chair because you literally pushed yourself as you coughed. Yeah. And it looked like a cartoon how much smoke you blew out of your mouth. I was like, would you fill that thing with glycol? <laughs> Glycerin. Oh my god. Yeah. Yes. Oh shit, apparently Sam's already patented that, Dank Runner says. It's funny. Patented what? Everything, whatever you're talking about, it's been done. <laughs> Stop trying. Look how awesome Sarah's I, I, background I, I, is. The idea of patenting anything. 
Oh shit, that's that's a novel and unique idea. I'm gonna go grab another battery. I'll be right back. Don't do it. Oh, hey Mark, I just wanted to show you um I got handed my new poster. Oh nice. Who did that? It's my friend Chris Perez, FTF Media. He's in um Riverside now in California. Ooh, really windy here. And uh, he's just an awesome artist. And so that's that's what I'm going to be putting in the newspapers and on the telephone poles and all over campuses and various places starting on Monday. Woo! Very exciting. Nice. I have all my sponsors here at the bottom. Thank you, guys. Sweet. That's yeah. nice. And I have, um, I have tickets. My last pluggy plug, I swear. I have general admission tickets. They're at various lounges and outlets. There's going to be a list on the website. So check it out. Well, glad you're doing it right. That's what doing it right is all about. Well, I, the whole point is to bring um, as many people as possible with a like mind together um, and give these awesome new companies that are starting up um, promotion and make, make, some, make them some money. So that's like my whole goal is to like, push it as hard as I can. Are all the samples tested for pesticides? Um, I believe so. I believe so. Well, make sure it's always important. That's a good, good, yeah, good thing to be doing. Yeah, so bunk in Canada. Like I I've done it now a lot, and uh, it's garbage. Basically, um, every lab is crappy. Um, they're no, never. They never get me the test no, when they say they're going to get. It's not true that all labs are garbage. Maybe in Canada, some labs are garbage, but all the ones I've used. All labs. Uh, I I had a lab for thirty years, and it absolutely was not garbage. Yeah, but you you had you in the lab and like Dave paid and like epic like top like the the upper echelon of like Canada is hurting I will admit for labs and I've we need a we need some good labs. Well, and Andia Labs is doing a good job. John Hello. Page's group at UBC. So yeah, they still not there. All right, yeah. a lot of them won't test for me because um, it's a uh, by the nature of the event they. They don't want to do my testing because they're licensed dealers. So that's right. another issue that we have here. So um, this time I'm using High North Labs. They promised me they're going to get it to me and it's going to be done and it's going to be all good. So let's see what happens. That'll be another I, fun. I, I find whenever I, and I obviously this is probably not an option for like cannabis cups and stuff, but whenever I have sent things to a lab to test it, um, you know, and I'm not testing like 50 things at a time by any means, but when I send things to a lab to test them, I send them to like two or three labs. Redundancy for sure, at least. I know that's not going to be an option for the cannabis so world. But so expensive. But when I'm having something, you know, when Indra is extracting oil, defatting oil from a protein powder isolate of hemp, I don't want a single lab to tell me the results. So I got three different labs to tell me the results. And in that you definitely see variation that does not put your heart at ease when it's like that shit was the same sample. Like what, what were they doing that it all came back different? To be honest, Marcus, all is, you can start by just looking at the protocol that they use for a GCFID mm. for terpenes or mm. a HPLC for uh, 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 cannabinoids. If their methodology isn't correct, then uh, it's probably not reproducible either. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, welcome. Welcome back there, Dragonfly Medicine. Hi. Hit you up all last. Me. Yeah, hit you up all last minute while you're like trimming up a crop. Hey, you want to come do hash church? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sarah's like in bed with no clothes on. Oh, let me get dressed. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure, get dressed. <laughs> My I'm apologies. honored to be on. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for coming back. We're just, uh, oh, we're talking about testing. We're talking about pesticides. We're talking about, uh, you know, the things that we seem to talk about over and over and over again. Wouldn't it just be great if there was two different sort of areas? Like if you, if you grow with pesticides, well, you kind of have to be over in this <laughs> industry. And if you grow without them, you're in this industry because the lab testing is just... We need to bring the, the the cost of lab testing down like we need to bring the cost of, of what's in that pen down. That looks Please. ridiculous. Jesus. 
Liquid those, gold. Are those available now, Tony? You said they were going to be around uh, July f uh, or August 1st. Oh, he's muted. They are coming along. These are the first ones that got out. You know, you got to you gotta test them out. Are you saying you want to be a tester? Oh, I'd love yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love <laughs> I'm not afraid of testing. Um, I'll tell you what's interesting about it, which kind of last night got some good reaction, is it's a tank. So see how the solution is thicker on the top? And then it goes into a section right here that's thinner, right? <clears throat> and then it's reusable, so you could open up this top over here and refill it. Right. Um, that's why it doesn't burn out the flavor. Right. Because of those right. separations. You're only hitting what goes into the bottom chamber, and you only get a little bit in, in there at a time. The majority stays up at the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dab trust me <laughs> we can see okay we believe i will never hear the same again natasha <clears throat> how did you enjoy that natasha now you didn't see that on the all-female panel <laughs> tony oh it's my a bio goodness. essay I, got just, I think guys are just naturally more obnoxious i hate to say it but uh, I think we are. You guys were so pleasant. I was just like, I watched in awe at the women. I'm not joking. Even now, yeah. I'm like, I can't do it. I don't know yeah. how to not talk over people. I don't know yeah. how to not be loud. I don't know how to not say the wrong thing. You mean you don't know how to be polite? Yeah. I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. You know, it's just crazy. Yeah, but wouldn't it be a real drag if we were all women or all men? I, I like the uh, oh yeah the don't get me wrong Sam absolutely I'm I'm also a big fan of the yin and the yang but being the side that I'm on it was very I just I really appreciated that panel it was good stuff did you just fill that up yeah so right now I mean I just take this little the applicators that we had before you put it right in between the two little stoppers and uh, fill it up. Oh, Lord, that looks surreal, bro. That looks like three little gold drops. Does anyone else see what I see? Yeah, the little air bubbles. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Hey, welcome, Adrian. We're just uh, geeking out on resin getting filled into a pen. <laughs> oh, you're just on mute, bro. Oh, yeah, I see that. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, right? <laughs> we like to geek out on a whole variety of things here. And, uh, well, shit, why don't uh, you introduce yourself, bro? All right, well, I'm, my name is Adrian Devitt Lee. Uh, I work with uh, Project CBD, which is a group in California that does a lot of education um, around cannabis and medicine. I also work with Canacraft, which is a, a producer and distributor in California. Um, I'm Martin Lee's son. That's how I got into this, uh, the cannabis world. Um, and he says hello to everyone. Um, uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, so uh, lately I've been doing a lot of stuff with pesticides and cannabis and pesticides. Um, but I'm also geek out about uh, filling <laughs> cartridges with oil. We've been working on some uh, some formulations at Canacraft, which are very fun. So I've been doing that a lot lately. Nice, nice. Well, you and Tony will have to link up after this because uh, he's all about formulas. <laughs> all about formulas. So, yeah, we were also talking about pesticides earlier today and just uh, – testing the cost of testing for yeah. pesticides and just uh you know sort of the overall bummer of not only the product being so already expensive for these oils but it being increased by the uh by the cost of of having to do high integrity conscious business which is to make yeah. sure that the product you're selling isn't uh, toxic poison yeah <laughs> yeah which is uh it's upsetting that that's something you even have to say aloud well, you know, we come from a unique place in this industry, which is prohibition. Yeah. And in prohibition, we know that all sorts of all sorts of things end up existing that aren't really ideal. That's kind of one of the main reasons we've been fighting against it, that A, getting put into prison, getting arrested, having our lives ruined. That's one really terrible side of it. But also selling toxic poison to patients is a really big side of it as well. Yeah, I didn't realize until recently actually how useful sometimes federal guidelines are in terms of like pesticides, you know, like because every state's done it differently. Every state kind of has to redo it um, and do it themselves. You know, they try to work with each other or base on each other. Um, but 
there isn't, you know, the, there's really limited information on what happens when you smoke pesticides. You know, um, a lot of, a few pesticides like mycobutanol, um, when you burn them, they break down to cyanide. And ironically, cyanide is probably the least of your concern in those cases because actually the pesticides are generally much worse. Um, I don't know if you guys know the workshop and Jeff Raber, but um, he was, uh, I had a conversation with him because he, uh, he was actually explaining that cyanide isn't nearly as big of an issue because when you look at toxicity, you generally measure things by their weight. Cyanide's a really small molecule and maybe a hundred times, it weighs a hundred times less than a pesticide. So if you have like 10 parts per million cyanide, that means you have a, a thousand parts per million of mycobutanol to begin with. And so actually, if you have a, like a toxic amount of cyanide in, uh, from smoking pesticides, it's uh, a much bigger issue is the pesticide itself. Um, so there's like a lot of issues about, you know, are some pesticides burn to much more toxic compounds, some to much less toxic ones. In vaporizers, you'd probably expect that you get a lot more of the pesticide. Um, that's, I think, probably the biggest issue with vaporizers right now is that if you have dirty oil, the way pesticide or the way heat breaks things down is a is a radical mechanism, a free radical sort of thing, and uh, cannabinoids are potent antioxidants. So in your oil, you're actually going to be preventing the breakdown of those pesticides much more if it's in a concentrate than if it's off of a flower. And so this is something I'm actually trying to get an experiment set up. Um, uh, to study this to be sure, but um, it would make sense that actually uh, dirty oil could be much more dangerous than dirty flour um, for, for just for pesticides. I mean, with smoking, there are other issues um, compared to vaporizing and all well, that. Well, you're, you're concentrating it into uh, 10 times, 10 fold, 10 fold. So if you know 10 grams goes into one gram of a, of a concentrated distillate, you're 10 times the uh, concentration value, right? So if you're not clean, you're just going to get dirtier and dirtier as you concentrate that. Yeah, yeah. another thing is a bunch of pesticides uh, are actually somewhat similar to cannabinoids chemically, not necessarily like the, the exact structure, but um, pyrethrins, which is a, a natural pesticide that comes from chrysanthemum, um, they have pretty much the same boiling point, pretty much the same polarity. They co-elute together, so you can actually have when you concentrate THC from 20% to 70%, you can uh, end up concentrating pyrethrins from like one part per million to even more than that, to like 10 parts per million. It can sometimes be more concentrated than, uh, you can con sometimes it concentrates better than the actual cannabinoids or terpenes that you want to concentrate. More nightmares, you know? My buddy, I'll never forget my Rasta friend, Mikey on the top of the mountaintop. I mean, Remo might have even been with us there. You had to climb the craziest gnarly like coral that probably was under the ocean a million years ago to get to the top of this guy's mountain. Damn near killed ourselves getting up there, sliced ourselves all up. We get up there. He's got like 50 gallon buckets up there that he brought up on his head. And he says to me, just simply put, he's looking for some sugar cane to, to hand crush for me so I can have a little drink while I'm up there. And he's, he's going to pick the, the sugar cane and he's like, He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. He's like, this is the one. I'm like, why'd you pick that one? He says, you see this? And I say, yeah, it's a wormhole. He says, the worm likes this one. That means it's not poison. I'm like, dude, that's fucking crazy because the what when at, at home when the worms like it, they spray that shit with poison to kill the worms. And here he is using the worms as his natural thermometer to find safety regions on his little island that many people pour content, uh, spray pesticides on. I mean, imagine living on an island and you're all like, I want to be organic and everyone's like, DDT, put more on your, on your ground. Like, it's crazy, dude. Yeah, I have a funny story about that as well. Uh, we used to do a lot of farmer's markets and sell all of our vegetables and stuff on Saturday market. And these old Quaker families used to come down. They were all in their 70s and 80s and all look through all of the top of our corn. So they're unpeeling the corn, and I was sort of like, what are you all doing? And she said, well, if the corn worm is not in there, then I don't trust it. I won't trust any corn that doesn't have the corn worm, and they're delicious to eat as well. So she would just pop them right in her mouth, and I asked her what they tasted like, and she said, like sweet corn. So wow. it was pretty interesting. I like that story. Yeah, that it's... Told. 
It's pretty well. It's the truth, right? It's the simple, simple, simple. I, I like have wow. A question about the pyrethium, uh, pyrethium that's being uh, tested positive from uh, cannabis. Where, where is that from? Is it from the resin, from the seed, from the leaves, the flowers, the stems, the roots? Where, where are you finding it from? It's not. It, it, assuming it's not just extracts. Yeah, usually uh, we've tested it in flower usually. So when you test it on leaves or like stems or something, sometimes you see a little bit that's, um, it, it, pyrethrins break down pretty quickly in sunlight. Uh, the half-life's like eight hours or something. But in the trichomes, when it's, when it's kind of collected alongside these cannabinoids, which again, it, it fits really well, it kind of intercalates. Well, that's uh, my question. It really Is well. it produced inside of a glandular head? It, uh, are you sure? So we're not sure. In chrysanthemum, it's mostly produced in uh, the trichomes. Uh, in chrysanthemum, it's almost exclusively produced in the trichomes, and then it, uh, the mother plant actually pushes it uh, into the seeds to protect the seeds from insects. Yeah, but it would either have to have the ability to or not. In yeah, and so we've uh, we actually there's Kevin McKernan and I and a couple of people at Sonoma Labs in California. Uh, we just recently submitted a paper uh, about this about the potential for cannabis to produce pyrethrins because we've been trying to explain why so many people are testing positive. Um, it's the the preprints online. Uh, I won't talk about it too much because it hasn't been reviewed yet. Um, but uh, the preprint you can see it's if you Google uh, endogenous synthesis of pyrethrins by cannabis. And we looked at the genetics and there are a bunch of genetic uh, markers or ge the enzymes that produce uh, pyrethrins and chrysanthemum. There are many homologs to that in cannabis. Um, and we find it very often in cannabis flowers when we test cannabis flowers. Um, it also comes up in the concentrate, but that's much less surprising. But I would expect that um, if it is, in fact, being synthesized in cannabis, it would be in the trichomes. And how, how is it produced? Is it produced by, by synthesis, for example? Yeah, so there's a, a common pathway. A lot of plants have these terpenes, you know, they make terpenes. Pyrethrins are a terpenoid. Um, and uh, the, there are kind of two main steps. One of them is from a fatty acid, um, and this is fairly common in many plant species. It's uh, making uh, jasmine. Um, it, it, and it, is it a monoterpene or a sesquiterpene? So it's uh, it's uh, a, a two monoterpenoids. Um, there's a ester bond that's formed, um, and so it's a, one monoterpenoid is called chrysanthemum, uh, chrysanthemol, or chrysanthemic acid. Um, it was discovered in chrysanthemum first, and the other is uh, jasmalone. So those are the two monoterpenes that are formed, uh, and then just an ester linkage is made by uh, an enzyme that's also very common to many plants. And so um, that's how it's done in chrysanthemum. Uh, and there are, there, we have some evidence that that could be happening in cannabis as well. Well, Kevin's the man to look. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's, uh, he was one of the big uh, main people pushing that project. And uh, if, you know, depending on this first uh the response kind of this first paper, we're gonna look at actually trying to express or model these genes from cannabis in another, like in a bacteria species to see if, uh, if the genes that are present in cannabis, the enzymes that are present in cannabis can make it outside of cannabis or if it's something just weird that's going on with like, you know, there are a lot of nutrients that have pyrethrins or other pesticides in them and aren't labeled. Um, and so part of the issue is certainly that, um, that people are unknowingly adding pyrethrins. Some of it is just bad practice where people are using pyrethrins and other pesticides and say they don't. Um, but uh, I, I think it is very possible that Canvas is making it, but I'm, I, I definitely want to see some more research to that effect before saying anything definitively. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, Dr. Osole and other people who have been, who look for compounds or Dr. Mishulam's uh, folks haven't found it before, but, uh, but maybe I'm mistaken and they have. I didn't look at well, the literature. Yeah, there, it hasn't been found before. Uh, two comments on that. One is, you know, the recent uh, 
marijuana that got sent to Sue Sicily for a study on PTSD that had a bunch of like, <laughs> you know, contaminants in it. So um, I, I have a lot of respect for El Sole, but that doesn't, you know, they haven't looked for everything. And uh, but um, and also, Doctor El Sole, to I, I I don't want to defend crappy weed, but <laughs> that's what he was contracted by the NIDA to produce. He, 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 he can't produce higher quality. He has the ability to, but that's not what the contract is for. And does the contract actually say crappy weed? It says <laughs> crappy Mexican swag. Damn. And then well, what they do is they <clears throat> But wouldn't it. that be, it wouldn't be Mexican swag. it to get rid of all the fines. In other words, the resin dust that fell off they want to remove that so it doesn't uh, clog up their bonsai. <laughs> That's but, the best. But but what is I mean? Do they are they growing like just Mexican land races? You think just That's 100, 150 the day grow. 150 day flowering? Flower. Yep. 150 day flowering. You think? I I, I don't know. <laughs> I <can ask> <laughs> Oh, so there's a, oh we're just throwing just... the hardest strain possible. We're pulling it at day 62 so we can get the least out of it. We know it's 150-day flowering, but why, why grow it all the way? Yeah, well, there's a paper that just came out looking at uh, how NIDA's marijuana compares to markets. I think it was in Colorado. Um, and the main thing they found was there was like 10 to 20 times more CBN, which for those of you who don't know it, CBN is what uh, THC and CBD convert to when it's left in the sunlight for a long time. So uh, they well, no, they also even say if you store it for three four years it it will start to convert to CBN. Yeah. Will you get a full conversion on that method with uh, with CBD to CBN? I didn't I didn't know you could do that with CBN CBD to CBN. Uh, it could happen if uh, I guess that would be CBD. V, it would probably it? be CBD to THC to CBN. Uh, it, 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 CBD can convert to THC. It yeah. doesn't. Uh, really happen in physiological like it, it wouldn't happen, happen on the like, plant yeah but if it's left in like high heat or sunlight for a very long time uh it could happen mm. definitely Adrian. all good stuff go ahead natasha oh i just wanted to ask do any other plants um besides chrysanthemum make uh, the Perithians? Is that how I say the Perithians? Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I've heard it said many ways. Pyrethrins is how I usually say it. Okay. Just to, uh, one thing about pyrethrins, there are six different compounds. Uh, it's a family of compounds. Um, there are a couple other species that uh, can make it. I, Artemisia, I think, is one of them. Um, I, it's mentioned, we looked at uh, three other we looked at chrysanthemum was the main one they were, we were looking at but there are two other species that um it, it's been reported in one or two papers that it it, it may happen um and you know when you and look at terpenes sorry what was that finish and then i'll ask uh, when you look at terpenes you know it's one of the most conserved pathways in plants it's what plants make to uh defend themselves to attract you know uh pollinators and things like that and it's a very a modular sort of pathway where, um, you know, one you can choose between 200 enzymes that will make different sorts of, uh, that will kind of take one piece and make the next. And so um, if you have the enzymes for, you know, some plants have some of the enzymes that make like chrysanthemic acid, but not the ones that will combine it with jasmine to make pyrethrins. And so it's, it's sort of like a mix and match of making different uh, terpenoid compounds. And so why is chrysanthemum making this product? It's a defense mechanism? Is that naturally yeah. what it's happening? Yeah, and so yeah, then could this be induced, um, like if the plant was under attack, could it be induced to be expressed? Is that how yeah. it could? When, uh, when it's, uh, there are two different uh, ways that it can be induced or it's known to be, or I guess three. One of them is uh, what I mentioned before, when a mother plant makes seeds, it actually coats some of the seed in pyrethrins. Um, when they start getting eaten by plants, there's a, or excuse me, by uh, insects, there's a, a they, it gets induced. And also um, when chrysanthemum releases certain volatile organic compounds, certain other terpenes, 
that signals to its neighbors usually it's under attack, produce more pyrethrins. So um, when some one plant's under attack, it not only makes pyrethrins, but makes other terpenes that signal to the plants nearby, hey, there, you know, there's this insect in the area. Um, you know, you gotta defend yourself. And so you said your next steps with this research were to confirm these pathways um, in like cell culture experiments or what, what's your next steps to show if this is actually happening or you know moving beyond just this is a hypothesis it could be happening. How do you prove this? Um, so I think it, it partly it just depends on what we have access to and kind of the people we know. And, you know, I, I'm friends with Kevin McKernan at Medicinal Genomics, and so that was a very easy way to start. Um, I, what I would like to see is, A, just uh, larger grows with, like, many plants and, and, you know, actually trying to wound the plants to see for harvesting, to see does that actually induce it, something like that. Um, so, A, just replicating it is, is a very... Uh, common uh, way to demonstrate something and also taking the actual genetics that we found and expressing that either um, doing a computational model of those enzymes or uh, expressing them in a bacteria and showing that when you give a bacteria the, the right genes from cannabis, it can make pyrethrins. And so that would be very, very strong proof. But honestly, first, I'd just like to see um, better, like more uh, uh, replicas of, of this, that, you know, people growing it in very controlled environments, you test the water, you test the soil, you test uh, everything and show that it, it didn't come from any source. It didn't come from your fertilizer or, or the ground or the water. It, it came from the plant. Did um, you say that perithium in uh, chrysanthemums has four or six different terpene compounds? Uh, six, yeah. Six. Okay. And you said in cannabis, they found two of those six? Um, so in cannabis, we were looking for only one of them. Um, and if, if uh, the, the paper, which is up on the bioarchive, again, it hasn't been reviewed yet, um, uh, or it's in the process. Uh, one of the issues we actually had was that pyrethrins, it, uh, the pyrethrin one is one of the compounds. Um, and that's normally what you test for. That's really what's tested for for limits in like California and Oregon um, because it's the most common. It's not actually the most potent in terms of its insecticidal properties. But um, we only tested for one. And there was some, uh, the, the mass spec was a little bit surprising um, the, that we had from it. Uh, there was it seemed like there was another compound there that we weren't really sure what it was. And it might have been uh, an isomer of pyrethrins, or it might have been actually a different compound that's similar. You know, as I said, these terpenes are sort of, when you're combining them, it's a mix and match for what enzymes the plant has. And so it might be making something that's very similar to pyrethrins. Um, we're pretty sure it's making at least pyrethrin 1 from this paper, uh, from this data. Um, but it might be making other similar compounds that just really look like pyrethrins, uh, pyrethrin 1. Um, yeah, the reason I'm asking is because if it has all six compounds, it's obviously going to be a pretty effective uh, supply of pyrethium, whereas if it's got one of them, uh, maybe it's less effective and less damaging. And uh, I, I've never heard of this, so I'm really quite surprised. Um, I, my uh, internet might be a little bit bad. I couldn't hear that very well. I, I, I just said I'm very surprised that it's found in cannabis. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, it's, it's preliminary evidence, and I, I would like to see more uh, data before we, we start saying that cannabis produces pyrethrins. I think we have some evidence that it, that it can, but, um, it, you know, and another thing is that it definitely doesn't happen in every plant. Um, a lot of the plants that we test for in Sonoma County um, test positive, um, but also a lot of growers use pyrethrins. Uh, we have found plants that uh, consistently test negative. Um, they've been CBD plants for the most part, and I'm not sure if that's coincidence or, uh, you know, that the genetics might be linked. Um,
You can also do an experiment where you're looking at, um, like I guess, what what kind of pathogen would this be specific for that they're using the the sprays for mites or insects what is it? and mites? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you could even do like plants in a controlled environment that are mite infested versus plants that aren't, and see like if this is happening, is it inducible? Is it is it uh, because like you're saying, some plants are showing it, some plants aren't potentially. Um, and I was also wondering if you could speak a little bit about, if this is true, how is this going to affect uh, pesticide testing and how, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, pesticide testing, there's a whole other issue with that in California. Um, Project CBD did a really, uh, like a 20-something page report on the initial proposed regulations. Um, then those regulations were uh, essentially uh, repealed under um, a different law and new regulations are going to be passed under an emergency ordinance in September or October and there won't be a public comment period because it'll be an emergency uh, uh, law. It's, it's a very weird setup in California right now. There are a lot of other issues. I would say, you know, the initial pesticide regulations you know, for, if you're looking at the toxicity of pesticides, you have to figure out how much you're actually using. And so they had an estimate on like edible consumption and their estimate was 10% of your body weight. So that's, you know, assuming that I'm eating 12 pounds of marijuana edibles a day. And that was part of where the limits came from. That's part of why they're so, so low in California. And I don't really want to be pushing higher pesticide limits. You know, I, I think Farmers should be using organic practices, you know, not doing monoculture. That helps with pests and weeds. There, there are a lot of other things that can help avoid uh, it, it just make the farming practices easier without pesticides be much better, but slow and just kind of arbitrarily so. Um, Again, 10% of your body weight eating that much in edibles every day is, a, is a, <laughs> quite an overestimate. But then the regulations on smoked products were based on tobacco. And tobacco has lobbied really hard against any regulations. So those are actually, in many ways, too lenient. Uh, uh, I mean, there, yeah, so there are a lot of issues independent of that. As far as cannabis making pyrethrins, if that uh, does pan out, uh, one of the big questions is for how long has it been doing this? Because it could be that in the selection away from CBD strains, maybe it's linked to the THCA synthase enzyme in, in some way. And so it could be that it doesn't necessarily guarantee the safety of pyrethrins. Um, if it, py cannabis has been making pyrethrins for a very long time, then all of the evidence about smoking cannabis being safe and not causing lung cancer uh, or oral cancers, then that would apply to pyrethrins. It wouldn't apply to concentrates. And remember how I said before how uh, the breakdown of, of pesticides when you vape off concentrates is actually probably much less than when you smoke it. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily speak to the safety of pyrethrins and concentrates. Um, but it would probably indicate that uh, smoking pyrethrins, you know, low doses of pyrethrins, not like pyrethrins, but, you know, parts per million concentration are probably, f uh, it, w it would suggest that they're safe, for, you know, relatively safe. Um, again, I don't want to be claiming that, like, it's, oh, pesticides are fine. You know, a lot of these pesticides are fairly toxic. Um, but pyrethrins, if you look chemically at, at its structure, it, it will break down into those two monoterpenes, neither of which are particularly toxic um, when you burn it. So uh, I think, again, smoking pyrethrins uh, is probably safer than vaporizing them. Um, but really, we just need safety studies. Um, and because, again, because of the tobacco industry, largely, it, it's lobbying, there's been very little information on what happens when you burn pesticides. So, uh, so we I need more really science, their safety, more education, we need more, more of that, you know, and um, thankfully, there's youth like you that are looking into and looking past these things so that we can get a better understanding overall. I know what Sam's done over the decades. But at the same time, you know, we have to push this further and, you know, keep at the research. And, and by the way, I patented a, a new variety called Perithium Free. 
and uh, it's guaranteed to have zero perithium in it. <laughs> Man, you work quick, Sam. You work yeah, quick. I, I, I know. I've been in the in the in the wings waiting for this. <laughs> Man, you must have that patent office on overdrive. That must be on speed dial, yo. <laughs> he, pa he patented the patent office, actually. They can't do anything without paying him. True. Yeah. That's also true. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I'm feeling pretty iry. So were there specific genetics that you were finding the pyrethrins in, or was it just across the a spectrum? Sorry, what, I didn't hear the beginning of that. What was my question? I oh, I didn't hear the beginning of that. Oh, uh, it was just... Um... You want to know what your question was? <laughs> I remember your question. There you go. It so was, do I. Well, okay, it was, was what, when you collected it, was, was it from a specific cultivar or just a variety of cultivars that you found these? Um, yeah, we were... Uh, so we have been... Testing, I mean, uh, I was working with Sonoma Lab Works, which is a testing lab in, in uh, Northern California. And so we've been testing all sorts of plants. But uh, this was the, the experiment that we did that were, is in the publication process. That was with hydroponically grown in a closed system. And it was, uh, I believe it were, they were Rebel Grown Seeds, uh, that, that company uh, from... I think the strain was metahaze, but I would have to check that. It's well, there it is. There it is. There you go. There it is. Looks like someone's having a pop. It turned out that the reason haze gets you so high is because it's got some freaking freaking perithium in it or something. Oh my and god! No, I'm not pronouncing it right, but. The, Everybody understands <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, that would be a that would be that can't be Sam. There's no way. Although we're gonna learn a lot of stuff in the upcoming years about these pathways and these relationships that are yet under you know not quite understood. Mm -hmm. Incredible. <clears throat> um, Adrian, I wanted to thank you for your work and what you all are doing. It is really phenomenal. I've been keeping up with. Um, your work and, and everything that you all are putting out, the new papers that you all are putting out has just been totally mind blowing and I'm really thankful for you and your group in this community. So I wanted to say that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, a lot of great people in this community that got me into science to begin with. So I, I have many, many people uh, in this world to thank for it. Well, thank you for following that curiosity and acting upon it. It's one thing to have the concept and the idea. It's another to act upon it and do it day after day. So thank you. And I wanted to just take a moment to talk a little bit about what you were talking about, Adrian, about plants. It's, you know, mostly what I'm interested in. And I believe that a lot of things that we ingest are actually a pesticide and that may actually be beneficial to our body um, and to our intestine as well. You know, we... Uh, lemon, say lemon rind, you know, uh, you mentioned artemisia, you know, that's another one. Wormwood is something that is utilized. And chrysanthemum is also utilized um, for, you know, 5,000 years in ancient Chinese medicine. So if you have a lung infection, uh, you know, chrysanthemum is utilized in those teas, you know, that you steep overnight and then drink these. So in small doses if it's directly from maybe mother nature or the plant itself without it being synthesized or concentrated in the way that you know science does um, you know it, it's interesting to look at a possible differentiation of what mother nature makes naturally as far as Perinthian is concerned and then also what we synthetically uh, have turned into it and, and what you know is something to look at I just want to, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, there are a lot of, you know, great compounds that come from plants. And if you look at, uh, I mean, most medicine has come from, we found that a plant does something. We found some of the receptors that it activates to have that effect. And then we tried to make something that does just that. We made a drug that does just that. Or, you know, one of the first pesticides was nicotine for, that we found was nicotine from tobacco. And then 
we made neonicotinoids, which are a kind of a catastrophe, but nicotine as a pesticide is actually really effective. And, and we learned a lot about how our minds work and how insects function just from studying, you know, what, what these plants make both as defense mechanisms and, and many turn out to be medicines for humans. Pretty trippy. I just wanted to say I really love the view off of your porch there in the Kootenays. It's just quite beautiful. I was blown away by Sarah coming in earlier with the sort of prairie fl wildflowers, the tree in the background, and then you came in with this beautiful view. You guys are crushing it. It makes me want to like get out of my office. Uh, you're welcome. We're waiting for you anytime. It's not far. And you can see there's a lot of smoke in the background. So we're actually, as you know, you know, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of fires right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have quite the view that we normally do. But, but it, it's, it's, it's fine. They're keeping it to a low and the winds are coming through. So we're good. Yeah. So that's the ha Harrop fire is the closest to you or? Um, I'm not really sure. I, th I think that there's quite a few that are, that are pretty, all around. pretty active all around. Yep. Jeez. There's some thunder and lightning that came through here and it's pretty easy to see that a fire is going to be caused from that. So we've been enjoying the sunshine though. Hasn't had a really good, beautiful, hot summer in a long time. So our gardens are really appreciating this hot summer. So we're really nice. thankful for it as well. Beautiful. Yeah, that's great. The Kootenays, for those of you that have never been, it's definitely a special place to drive through. I was lucky enough to go there in the 90s, and I got turned on to the Holy Smokes Boys, Alan Middlemiss, and Dustin Sunflower, and Paul DeFelice, and my friend Terry, and some other old schoolers, like, man, going to the co-op in Nelson, and you know, growing the A1 magenta and helping mix soil with the boys in the 90s. That shit was, uh, that, that was, that was, made me who I am today. That was some of my first outdoor gardening exposure, you know, to yeah. go on these hillsides of the Kootenays and digging holes and mixing huge piles of dirt with these guys. Yeah. That was wonderful. And then they would always and like end up in trouble and defend themselves in court and then like win. I was just like, you guys are amazing. And for us, that's where it all came from. You know, we weren't able to hike seven hours out with any pesticides with any fertilizers, with any, you know, glacier rock dust, or I mean, all you could possibly backpack out was your kid and a little bit of food, you know, so you yeah. did what you could. So that's where all of our practices originate from, you know, what is it that we can find out in those patches that we can ferment and turn into nutrients for the plants and for the microbiology. So, yeah. you know, living that dream from the 90s hasn't really ended. It's just, um, you know, gotten better. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm definitely coming now. Definitely coming. Now. <laughs> You're welcome. You got to come now. I mean, it's happening. Oh Things are bumping gosh. now for sure. And the lake is really hot. It's great to swim in all day long. Wow. Crazy. That's something yeah. you don't hear every day in the Kootenays. The lake is yeah. really hot. Well, at least the top six inches. If for you sure. stay on the top six inches, you're pretty good. Yeah, no, I've been I've been in the summertime where the lake gets warm and it's like this is like such a blessing. You guys have to understand this is like a glacial fed lake fed lake that is so cold it, 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 it throughout the rest of the year, like very, very cold. Uh beautiful to swim in for that short period of the summer though. Such a yeah. awesome lake. Yeah. Very cool. We got a whole bunch of people talking about mountain grown trichomes. Something just beautiful about mountain grown trichomes. Something about those variables at certain elevations that allow the genetics to, to express its potential to a level that is not often replicated in an indoor grow room. I have an affinity for it. I love sun grown resin. I love tropical sun grown resin. It often blows my mind because terpenes are so volatile and we think, oh, if you can smell them in the air, that means they're evaporating out and you're losing them. Yet here I go to a field in Jamaica and it's 35, 36 degrees Celsius every day, just beating down on these plants. And you'd think, well, if these terpenes are volatile, like how can they continue to produce terpenes consistently while the sun is blazing them off at the most accelerated rate? I'm talking about like turn my skin red in 15, 20 minutes, like hot, hot sun. It blows my mind. Well, when you look at the profile, so they do lean towards the sesquiterpenes. Sure. Makes sense. <laughs>
And, you know, we, uh, we are always looking into different pest uh, remedies here in a natural way, you know, and doing lots of different tests and trials with different plant uh, washes. And what we've found has been tremendously successful if you are growing in greenhouses is to do heat treatment. And that just goes along with what you were talking about, Marcus. You know, you can utilize the sun and the heat to get rid of pests on a massive level and, you know, talking about 36, 37 degrees on a constant, when you heat up your greenhouse to that sort of level, it's phenomenal how much the plants love that heat. I mean, you'll walk in there and after you've, you've cranked up the heat to 38 or 40 in your greenhouse and the plants are just praying and they're so excited about the heat. You can so, rock some Bikram yoga nice. out of there. You can rock some Bikram yoga in there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you walk in, it's an instant sauna. You know, you're going to want to stay with your plants and everything. But it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal remedy. Um, and also the plants really like it. The pests don't, but the plants really do. Interesting. Well, humans, we're always coming up with new ways to get these little bugs off of our food and out of our smoke. I'm sure we'll continue to uh, come up with the most unique ways. It's nice to see. I was really excited with Peter from Soil Balance Pro coming in and giving us the uh, the bacteria on the roots uh, knowledge. That that shit has not left my mind. I actually brought a bunch of it down to Jamaica. He sent me a, uh, 50 grams of it, and I brought it to Jamaica, and we'll probably be uh, testing out one of our fields or half a field. I don't know. I'm not the grower. The master grower will be the decider of that, but uh, I passed them on to Peter. I passed them on the materials, and uh, I definitely look forward to seeing, you know, the the results of you root my symbiosis. Mind. I just actually went onto their website, and about five minutes ago, if you saw me doing, I just bought a ten gram thing for Checo for fifty three eighty five. So it's on its way. Um, thank you for educating me on it, of course, in the beginning, then talking about it while we were in Jamaica with uh, there, and of course, getting back, that's what I did. Um, that's awesome. Right on, Johnny B. Let me know how it goes. I wish I had plants in the ground right now. I have a hundred plant license, and I don't have a single plant in the ground. That's kind of like maybe criminal, isn't it? I should be growing plants, but uh, when you're as busy as I am, the thing I can't do is plant a garden, take care of it, get it to the point where it needs an enormous amount of work and then bugger off to Jamaica for two weeks while my wife with a toddler and two teenagers has to take care of it. I don't think so. And they're not allowed to take care of them to move. So. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Out of respect for my wife, I haven't planted any plants. It is a shame. I know it's wrong, but it's out of respect for my love. Hello, Dank Duchess. Welcome to the room. I know it's sad, but it's out of respect for my wife. So that makes it less sad. Shall we have a bong rip here on Hash Church? I think we should. I know I'm going to. Don't feel you know that you have to so, by any means. Let's shell. I, I, I left my first balanced dry sift in this container when I left the Jamaican. When I came back, it all turned to. Ooh, the sound of parchment next to the Sorry, microphone. Sorry, sound of parchment, but it all turned Ooh. into this nice little. Oh, it looks like an elephant. I know, but Look it's that. so tasty. I just pressed that out and showed you what we were talking there and how there's definitely nothing ever sprayed on this plant. So we know there was no pesticides or anything that were uh, put in this. So, of course, nice and fresh resin. But um, definitely um, when it hits a little bit of heat, it just turns right into a little goo. On that note, that's what I'm hitting. All right. Rip it up there, Johnny B. Rip it up. You know, it won't be long when this guy who did this shirt <laughs> with all these internet names, it'll be like, it'll be your name on here, Adrian, and Natasha, and all these, the, all the researchers. I want a shirt with all the like doctors and researcher names on. People be like, who's that on your shirt? I'm like, bro, you don't know about CBD synthase? Gotta oh, check dude. that shit out, bro. Got the shulam right here, dog. <laughs> <laughs> some, some grin spoon over here. That's awesome. You know what? Some for me, rise over here. Listen, I have a full respect for all of the different aspects of cannabis knowledge, but I really I respect the scientist. I love the the knowledge of going in and figuring out these mechanisms, these pathways, learning what's happening, and then explaining it to uh, to us, the laymen, because I I'm intrigued by it for sure. 
but you also advance us politically and sociologically and on so many yeah. other levels that oh push God. us. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are without science. We would still be there. Oh, you guys are just trying to get high. But fortunately, you know, science is consistently proving otherwise. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was science, not a Cheech and Chong movie, that Sanjay Gupta realized he had been shammed. You know? <laughs> I was lied to. I was lied to, he said. I was like, right on, that takes well, that's a, takes a big man to kind of come out and say you you kind of didn't know what was going on and now you do. Sure, sure changed things for a lot of people, those people that would never have even considered such a thing without someone like him. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if it's their sons and their daughters and their brothers and sisters and spouses, whatever. Telling them this like crazy, it won't be until like Sanjay Gupta goes on CNN and says, hey, this shit's actually medicine. But like, did you know that this shit was medicine? Yes, mom, I've been doing this for 25 years. I absolutely. Yeah. And that's realized. interesting, too, because what you just said is also really in lieu of and in light of, you know, all of the different people that have been out there and already knowing that this is a medicine for a long time. And it's not till Sanjay, you know, says something in the same way that it's not until the scientists that actually study it says something <coughs> that it actually, you know, gives real meaning to it. But, you know, all of us without the science have known for a long time, you know, if not beyond, you know, thousands of years that this is an incredible medicine and we haven't had science. So it's well, great that there's light shed on what we're doing now that science is now interested in studying it. So what a beautiful fusion. We had the, we had the birth of science, which was the bioassay. And the bioassay is the birth of science. And we had, we were trying it on ourselves and eventually it turned into gas chromatographs and HPLCs and proton HNMRs. But uh, the bottom line is we did, we were able to do our, I mean, how, how, how much, here's, here's a funny story. First time I made bubble out of mint, because I started playing around with a bunch of different plants, herbisante and chamomile and mint and lavender and rose, and I made bubble hash out of these plants back in late 90s, early 2000s. When I made the mint, I, the, for whatever reason, I just was like, it was, it was like really hash. It was the most hash-like substance, like rose was pink and weird, and ha the mint was hash. It was gummy. You could, you could, you could do this with it. It was like hash. And so I was like, right away, I was like, oh, I'm going to do a 50-50 rip. I'll take a, a rip of the mint. I'll take a rip of the, um, of the bubble hash. I'll mix it in together, and then I'll take a And I was still uh, burning back then. I wasn't vaporizing. I was using Beeline or probably a match inspired by Sam at the time on a fresh, new stainless steel screen. And uh, I ripped this, and I blew it out. And I remember, because I knew the bubble hash really well, and it was... It was coffee stuff, let's just say. It made you cough. It was an expectorant, to say the least. I hit this thing, and I blew it out, and it was so smooth. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So I, like, Google, like, mint cough suppressant and come up with this, like, Phillips Morris $23 million project of, like, figuring out what would suppress cough with tobacco. And they came up with mint, like uh, mentholated, mentholated cigarettes. And so they spent $23 million on that. I felt like the Russians to the U.S. when they spent all the money on the, the pen that would write in space and the Russians just brought the pencil. I felt like the Russians because I literally had figured this shit out in like 25 minutes, one gallon batch, mint and bubble, my bong, a lighter uh, or a match and a stainless steel screen. And here, here this big company had to spend $23 million to figure it out. Bioassay. Well, the, uh, you know, cough drops, like Ricola cough drops, that's pretty much just menthol, the thing in mint. Right. <laughs> yeah. Pretty effective. Yeah. Well, for those of you that have never made mint hash, I do implore you to go find some beautiful mint, all sorts of varieties. Mint is uh, secretes its essential oils in, uh, out of glandular trichomes. There's a few different types of them on there, and they really are uh, very similar to cannabis. You get a much lower yield, not quite as low as rose, which is incredibly low yielding. It has a very small amount of these uh, trichomes. As you go looking for plants that secrete essential oils out of trichomes, you realize cannabis is at the top of the heap, 
top of the pile, like not, numero uno, the gold medalist uh, each and every time. Hey, look at that, Peter, right Marcus. next to a water. You're next to a waterfall, dude. dude That's amazing. I love you guys. Dude, I had to give you this beautiful journey for a second, man. Dude. <laughs> I, have to, I, I know there's probably some excellent conversation going on, and you guys are doing some beautiful, high-level, amazing stuff. So here's to a waterfall. And uh, that is that is so awesome, guys, dude. Your work, Marcus, you're so beautiful, you guys. I love you guys. Right on, Peter. That is just super cool that he came in like that. We just literally spoke about Peter just so not so long ago, and now he's sharing an epic waterfall. I mean, my God, that waterfall could be anywhere. It looks like Agua Azul in uh, near the border of uh, Guatemala and uh, Mexico. I'm sure it's not, but looks like it. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It's actually uh, Sabino Canyon, this beautiful valley in the desert. So gorgeous mountains, saguaros everywhere. Beautiful. Guys, have a great morning. I just wanted to stop in, send my love and my respect for all of you guys. So it's hard for me to hear, but just wanted to send that love and appreciation and gratitude for your work and all of you guys. So much love. Give thanks, Peter. That is very awesome of you to come in and uh, share a minute of a beautiful waterfall. You see those huge cacti at the end there when he turned to the pan to the hill? There was those giant... Cactus, that's awesome. This is the vibe of Hash Church. It's pretty good. And you know, getting back to you know, plants that have high resonance and high terpene counts, it's really awesome. And I encourage people to also make teas out of those. They're all over the place. They're everywhere that you look, and you can make teas so easily. And you can spray them on your gardens as a foliar. You can drench them into your soils. There's so many different uses, and it's fun to find out, you know, do one plant in lavender and maybe another plant in, uh, I don't know, Oregon grape or, or, or fir leaves or something else, and you can really test to see what plants like different things. So that's been pretty interesting as well. We were always, um, you know, looking at that. Mm -hmm. Plant symbiosis for certain. I mean, I know Paul Stamets has been doing some absolutely incredible work with the fungi, with the mushroom. Like everything that guy does is like standing ovation level of quality. Uh, we got to go see him speak not too long ago in uh, Richmond, BC, and it was definitely, it was pretty good, wouldn't you say, Natasha? Yeah, that was a really inspiring talk. And I wanted to ask you more about what you were talking about. And I know I've asked you a few times, but when you were making um, stuff with lavender, how does that compare to peppermint? Um, uh, oh, no. Are you talking about terps? Yeah. I'll, I'll... The both. Like, I want to know um, lavender with when you're concentrating it. And I also thought that was really interesting what you were saying with the lavender, pouring it on your plants. Um, were you using it for insecticides or what purpose? Yeah, and an overall wash, you know, to, to keep your plants clean is a really good idea in the same way that you want to keep your cyanobacteria and your leaf structure totally healthy. And it's great to look at a just a really easy microscope, you know, do a wash of lavender, and it's really interesting. A lot of the beneficial bacteria will continue to stay on that leaf surface, but get rid of a lot of the dust and maybe some of the pathogenic fungi and yeast. So lavender is pretty fantastic for just washing and keeping in a preventative leaf uh, coating. Um, I wanted to say about lavender, when I had my uh, vapor bar back in 2003 in Vancouver, I had this bar called the Inhalation Station of Vaporization. And we had a whole host of variety of vaporizers, the Aromed from the German uh, company that was really in a, a consortium of patients, uh, I believe even cancer patients. They were the ones that designed this vaporizer. It was used with a light bulb and it had a glass bowl. Uh, we had the Volcano, of course, from Stores and Bickle. Uh, we had the Volatizer from uh, David Wheeler at the time who had the quartz bowl with that. All these really unique vaporizers back then that, that were in existence. And we started vaporizing herbs uh, with people that came in from this, you know, customers that walked in off the street. And we'd have a whole variety of different herbs to vaporize. And lavender was, was really the one that people enjoyed the most. And we didn't even really realize how medicinal it was, but it was unbelievable 
the, the power of vaporizing lavender, especially for people who had asthma or bronchitis or any type of lung ailment, it seemed, because if you look at how lavender treats skin when skin is burned, lavandula oil, I think even lavandula oil was like the birth of aromatherapy. I, I, I believe the story goes a French chemist burns his hand on the Bunsen burner, sticks it in the lavandula oil and uh, doesn't even get a blister. Uh, it's very, very effective, maybe more effective than aloe vera on burns. So imagine the vapor being inhaled into the lungs. Uh, very, very nice and smooth and mentholated as well when you exhaled it. But uh, I had a friend with a serious, serious case of um, chronic, um, oh God, what was it? It was uh, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis that he had had almost 10 years and he started vaporizing lavender out of the uh, out of the volcano bag, and it was about two weeks in that he was just like, "I don't have bronchitis anymore, man," and and I haven't not had bronchitis for ten years. So, I've always used it as well, lavender. If I'm getting like sickness or like a a, a lung ailment, I'll vaporize lavender. I definitely stand by that. It's uh, pretty healing. You could also do mullein. Mullein is another wonderful and uh, expect, expectorant. You can take little bong hits of that dried along with your weed, or you can vaporize it as well. Uh, wild cherry leaf is a fantastic expectorant, and that's something that has a tremendous amount of terpenes. You know, if you can find a wild cherry tree, they grow around all up and down the Pacific Northwest. The bark is utilized. It has a lot of terpenes in it, but if you hit the early spring leaves, that also can be burned and utilized as well. I mean, we really could go on and on with uh, plant medicine, but you're right, lavender is a fantastic uh, ally. Absolutely. Is everyone froze up there? I don't see many motions. Oh no, there's some motion. All of a sudden, every that was weird. Everyone was like, and then they all started moving. That was pretty good. Well played, gentlemen. And ladies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just listening to some amazing knowledge that's coming through on the pesticide end and the information that was dropped. This one is kind of making me think and I want to go and work on my plants and do some pruning and have had them outside. They've been kind of living in the air and enjoying life. Beautiful. It's always nice to have plants. Like I said, I wish I had some myself. It was nice to be in that acre in Jamaica and walk around all those big, beautiful, lush cannabis plants and just uh, smell all the different terpene profiles coming off of each different row, which was each row was a different cultivar. Man, there was some, I love Jack Frost. There's something about that Jack Frost that just has the most beautiful terpene profile. I do kind of look forward to the days where the names aren't really as much as the terpene profiles, you know, where we really understand that what Jack Frost really is, is it's a terpene profile. And there's going to be ones that are the majority and ones that are the minority. And there may even be many of them, like Sam said earlier, that the labs aren't testing for. I want to know every one that's present because I don't think just because it has a lot or a little, it doesn't have the ability to affect the profile a great deal. I mean, look at look at an herb like, uh, oh, what's that herb? Cilantro. So strong, the tiniest little bit on a big meal, especially for someone that's like, oh, I don't like cilantro. Just put a tiny little bit of cilantro in someone's meal that doesn't like cilantro. It is unreal how strong that can be. And I can tell you, it's not the most prevalent terpene in the in the batch. I'm one of those people. I don't like it. It's, I just, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> no. And yet you can definitely tell and taste the slightest hair. It's not even funny. Oh yeah. And when it has a, like a good amount, like a pinch, then it's like, whoa, that is. And I'm in California, so it's impossible to find a, a, a salsa or, a, you know, a burrito or anything without here. Here's it even sprinkle on top. So I'm, I'm yeah, I have my own hell. <laughs> Listen to what Taste Bud 420 just said. You can bullshit a name, but you can't bullshit a terpene profile. I like that. It's like hard to bullshit that. People will say a name and I'll smell it and be like, oh yeah? I don't think so. There's a lot to be said in the nose. Welcome back, Dr. Natasha. Cilantro makes a great foliar too, as well. 
And if you let it grow into, you know, the flower a little bit and it flowers up before it turns into the coriander seed, I mean, the plants freaking love it. So you can make an easy tea out of that or you can fresh press it into juice, add a couple of tablespoons into a gallon of water and foliar spray and the plants just freak out on it. Thinking coriander. of, you know, small amounts. I just wanted to say coriander seed essential oil is also pretty interesting. Um, can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Sure. Yep. Um, no, coriander seed is really interesting, especially for people who don't like cilantro. Um, I was one of the people who hated cilantro for the longest time, and then it was weird. In my 20s, something shifted, and then all of a sudden, I, like, crave cilantro all the time now, and I, like, throw, like, handfuls. Like, I eat it more than I eat any other green. Just, like, I buy a thing of cilantro, and I'll eat that within two days, like, on top of everything. Um, it's but, one of the best chelating herbs out there for getting rid of heavy metals, cilantro is. But go ahead about coriander. Yeah, yeah, and then the coriander seed essential oil, when I started working with that, um, it just blew me away the aroma of it because it's actually 60% linalool, which is similar to what's in lavender, um, which is even higher than lavender, which is crazy. And so it has just this like lovely aroma. And so even working with it um, in my perfumes is just a fun essential oil that I was completely overlooking for the longest time because I just was assuming it smelled like the greens, but it, it smells completely different. Ayurveda uses that um, for a lot of different ailments. They use it both internally and also as flushes. They used it externally. They use it to elevate the, the mood. And there's a black coriander that's especially useful for medicinal purposes. And you can grow that type of cilantro as well. And it just even has a higher uh, terpene residual. Yeah, and it's, uh, I, I just, I find it so fun working um, with uh, just working with these plants in different ways. And similar to cannabis, you think like, like if you're just talking about the cannabis plant, it's like, well, what part of the plant? How are you using it? And how is it processed? And we have to remember that every single plant is just as complex as cannabis is and can be used in all these different ways. And what you're using the flower for might be a completely different application for the root of the plant or processed in different ways. So it's, I haven't worked a lot with teas. Um, I've done obviously teas drinking and even I've done a little bit of herbal teas um, for like hair rinses and experimented with um, not even just for coloring, but like I've used hibiscus teas um, for hair and it's crazy. It makes your hair feel just like really nice and silky and like thick. Um, and even hibiscus is this beautiful red color and it has it's one of the highest antioxidant teas that's and also good for your heart. Um, do you work with hibiscus or any of uh, like? Those? I do. I love hibiscus. I think that it's really wonderful. You know, people and Ayurveda has been using it for a really long time to strengthen the venous, you know, um, tissue and our fine capillary tissue. And I always feel like whenever I'm making a wash out of hibiscus, I can really notice that the leaf structure gets a little bit thicker because we'll always do something maybe three times in a row to really understand it because plants respond so quickly to it. But I've noticed with hibiscus that it's almost thickened the outer layer, excuse me, of the leaf structure. So I love hibiscus. I think it's really amazing for a lot of different values. What do you have to say about that, Sarah? with your hair blowing in the wind. You're on mute. Just like I'm loving all the knowledge and the fact that I, I, I'm on a farm here and I have all the sorts of these plants. I've got like giant hibiscus plants that I bring in and out every year and I've got big patch of mint and raspberry. I've got all sorts. So it's like I, I love the idea of um, playing around with all this stuff and, and having some fun. I love the knowledge. Thank you guys so much for having me today on the show. Um, I certainly don't have the same level or type of knowledge as you, but I really appreciate um, being able to come on and plug the cup and the event and all the people involved in it. So thank you. My battery is basically dead now too. So this is my sayonara. Well, right on Sarah, be well. I'm sure we'll uh, yeah. talk to you soon and see you soon after that. Absolutely. I will see you soon. Take care, Mark, and everybody else. Peace out, Sarah. Yes, Sarah Sunday.
Sarah always had nice buds and nice concentrates. She's always kind of had a good uh, ear to the ground when it comes to quality of cannabis products. There she goes. Where is Sarah? She's out in Ontario? Yeah. Yeah, she lives out in Ontario. I'm not sure exactly where, but uh, somewhere. Yeah, well, I met her once. I think it was at Lyft when we were all we all went out for dinner at one point. But we were a big group of us, so we just had like a nice little chat. But it's cool. Hope to hang out with her more. I think I remember that dinner. I think we decided to sit on those strange square cushions instead of a, an actual table and chairs, just because we all wanted to eat. Does that sound familiar? Hotel room, something hotel, restaurant. It all melts into one after you do about 500 of these events. Oh, please don't be sorry muting me, Sarah, uh, Natasha. Mute me anytime. I, I often need it. I forget. I'm texting people. I was uh, a little delighted. I started hearing echoes. Is my voice still okay? I feel like it's still off. You guys can hear me okay, though? Okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, yeah, because can everyone mute everybody, or is that – do I still have, like, no powers? No. It should just be, well, oh no, you can, yeah, I think everybody can mute everybody, absolutely. <laughs> now we'll all just be like, nah, nah. <laughs> Down to sign language. Nobody yeah. ever told me that. You mean, I've got the power? Uh-oh, uh-oh. I thought you patented that like I months ago, say, Sam. Didn't you patent that, Sam? It's like, <laughs> come on now. No, somehow it yeah. slipped through my fingers. Right. Yeah, I think I accidentally muted Chimera. I got a little eager last episode. I was mute, mute, keeping the sound nice, and Chimera was mid-sentence. I just muted him, and I was like, oh, no. I've, I've, I've done that. It's always harder to unmute them. It's not as quick. It's like, oh. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I can't unmute this. Did I ban him or something? Yeah, well, even worse is when you don't realize the cursor is on the Google chat, and then you go to type something. And you hit like all the right things to actually open up and then eject someone from the room with just the keyboard. That's uh, it's happened a few times to me. It is what it is. I wish I had some of my drone footage from Jamaica um, uploaded so I could share with you guys some of that footage because it was uh, it was good. It was good. So nobody with shotguns shooting down drones? Nobody with shotguns shooting down drones. Nope, nope, sir. I mean, we're on a 20-acre property that, we're, uh, that we are in control of, So, and I don't fly the drone off of that uh, 20 acres. But uh, I'm sure you could fly your drone somewhere in Jamaica where it would get shot down. But I wouldn't suggest it. These things are expensive. Drones. Every time you put it up, you're just nervous. Like, oh, is this going to be the time that this two thousand dollar camera that's basically attached to a drone is going to fall on the ground and smash into a million pieces? It's a horrible feeling. I hope that you never have to feel it, Sam. I really do. Even though you've probably patented that feeling already. I'm. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have to feel a feeling before you patent it. Yeah. Hey, so Adrian, tell us more what uh, you're up to. Are you heading to any conferences? What's you were just traveling somewhere? Where were you? Oh, I was just on vacation recently. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I am going. There's a conference at Northeastern that Alex Macriani is putting on. He was the guy uh, who crystallized the CB1 receptor, and he's been involved in uh, making a lot of different compounds. If you ever see a compound that's AM. Uh, 404 AM251. The AM compounds are uh, Alex Macriani. Interestingly, AM404, it was discovered that Tylenol breaks down into AM404 and it's a anandamide reuptake inhibitor. So, Tylenol actually, some of the anti anxiety and uh, potentially pain killing effects from, of Tylenol come from it uh, 
increasing the activity of endocannabinoids. It's, that's not where its toxicity comes from. That comes from something else in the liver. But so he's, he's been involved in a lot of drug design and uh, kind of designing drugs based on understanding how cannabinoids work. Um, and so uh, that's what he's, the conference is about something on uh, drug design and drugs of abuse. But uh, that it should be interesting. It's in uh, Boston in like two weeks or so. So that's coming up. Nice. That sounds like an interesting conference. Yeah, interesting people, hopefully, <laughs> presumably. Are you going to the uh, European Cannabinoid Research Conference? The ICM? Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, that one's in uh, September out in Cologne. And there's, there's uh, I actually just saw the uh, speaker lineup just came out for that one. And there, there's a bit on pesticides and like, uh, and health, there's a, a bit about medicine and kind of what each uh, country's what each country is experiencing in terms of regulations and uh, just legalization overall. So France has someone speaking, I believe. Germany has someone speaking. Canada has someone speaking. Uh, there's at least one person from the U.S. speaking about some of the struggles in the U.S. I'm not sure if they actually are specific to different states. Um, but I'm hoping to go to that one because that uh, has, we'll have a lot of great scientists there. Ethan Russo and Jehan Marku are both talking about quality of marijuana. So two good people to be speaking on that. Imagine if Ethan Russo was on like the Grateful Dead lot and came up to you and was like, I'm going to tell you about the quality of cannabis. <laughs> Yet he would for sure know more than anyone else on the lot. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah. Ethan's a great guy. And he also, he's one of those people who's really, you know, he, not about genetic engineering and, and pesticides, but really organic practices and just growing well and breeding well to make, make good strains. And, you know, he's, he's been a big force behind keeping the side of, of the science on marijuana to you know, good agricultural practices, and I think uh, a lot of people owe him some thanks for that. Absolutely. Oh, we lost Dragonfly Medicine. She's got a bounce. She'll be back another weekend. Excellent. Well, I don't know. Pretty chill. I'm like, I think because it's the first time I've been back for. A couple of weeks that I'm anxious to uh, go hang out with my family and go spend the Sunday afternoon doing Sunday afternoon things. So I don't know. Do you guys have anything else you want to cover on today's hash church, or, sh or shall we cover it another weekend? Definitely would love to have you back, Adrian. You've got some great knowledge. I'm interested in what you're doing, and uh, very uh, thankful, Dr. Natasha, invited you in. Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to come back sometime. <laughs> I, I would be really nice interested morning. to see if uh, uh, any of these compounds are actually produced in the resin or just in the rest of the plant because it makes a big difference. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I'll certainly keep uh, y'all in the loop as as we figure more out because it's it's very interesting and there's there's a lot to know and it's it's all exciting to learn. Awesome. All right, everybody, we'll call it a day. Thanks, Mr. Skunkman Sam, for coming in and sharing your knowledge as, all, as always. Thanks, Dr. Natasha, for uh, helping me co-host today and being a part of church. And as always, Etienne, being the number one guy in the room every morning, we do appreciate that. And Adrian, thanks so much for coming in and sharing what you've been sharing with us. Thanks to D420K and Johnny B., uh, Tony V and Peter Sav from Soil Balance Pro who came in and shared a beautiful waterfall with us. And uh, yeah, Sarah Sunday for coming in and uh, letting us know what's going on with the Karma Cup. Anyone I've forgotten, terrible. I feel terrible, but uh, well, we got to end it. So we'll see you guys next week on Hash Church. Thanks, everybody. Peace out.